or engagement process that we've done as part of this project. Um, so we have speakers from academia and from industry who have a, a, a breadth of experience in both the implementation of uh, off-highway automation and indeed the, the design of off-highway off automated vehicles. Um, we have a fairly full program today uh, and we're going to need to um, whistle through it fairly quickly so where there is time for questions we'll, we'll take some questions as we're going but we also have a 20 minute slot right at the end where we can have a discussion and deal with any any matters that arise throughout the presentation uh, and I'm happy that that carries on after four o'clock if uh, if people are available to to continue that um so let me say a few words briefly about who TRL are for those of you who are new to TRL. So TRL is the Transport Research Laboratory. Um, we were formerly a government agency. We were part of the uh, Ministry of Transport up until 1996, uh, at which point we were privatised and we now operate as a uh, non-profit distributing research company. Um, our history goes back about 85 years. Uh, so we've been involved more or less with, the, with the, all of the development or all of the interesting development, certainly in the UK, of road transport and I mean, fundamental things like the invention of the mini roundabout and the invention of the zebra crossing and those kinds of things um, were uh, down to down to TRL. Sorry, is my just checking that my slide is advancing on your screen? No. One moment then. We play hunt hunt the appropriate screen. There it is. Right. Still not advancing on your screen. That's not helpful. One second, folks. We we were talking, Giles, about the danger of online conferencing. And here we have perfect demonstration of when it all goes wrong. How about now? Perfect. Can you see the TRL about TRL slide? Yes, indeed. Excellent. Good. Um, I should mention, so I, I mentioned that TRL is a non-profit distributing research company. Um, we are wholly owned by a foundation, the Transport Research Foundation, uh, and we are effectively a family of uh, transport research companies. So there is a software company uh, and there is also an organisation called SMLL, the Smart Mobility Living Lab or Smart Mobility Living Lab London. In fact, they're the Smart Mobility Living Lab London Limited, but we ignore the last half a dozen L's. So they're SMLL. Uh, SMLL was founded uh, a couple of years ago as part of a, a project to create a, uh, a test and development environment for on-highway automated vehicles. Uh, and we built a test site uh, in two sites in London on public and private roads. So we effectively instrumented those sites so that the, uh, the, the, the developers of automation systems of automated vehicles can have an environment in which they can test their vehicles and, and we're able to uh, effectively uh, monitor what they're doing and, and, and collect data from the road to, to, to see how those vehicles are performing. OK, so on to the subject for today, which is the uh, the code of practice for the operation of automated off-highway vehicles. Um, this project was funded by Innovate and has been part of a much bigger project uh, in which we have partnered with Oxbotica. Oxbotica have been working on technology for uh, off-highway automation, whereas we have been working on uh, the safety of off-highway automated vehicles. Um, and our priority here was looking at operation as distinct from the design of those vehicles. Um, and what we wanted to do is establish a baseline for potential operators uh, and, and to, to, to begin the process of creating a legal framework for the operation of automated off-highway vehicles. Because currently um, there is really a limited amount of guidance and standardization. If you, if you want to go out and you want to start using automated vehicles for real, as opposed to doing it as an experiment, it is um, a, a bit of a grey area in terms of the legality of that. 
we as TRL have uh, a very long history of creating guidance and safety cases and, and codes of practice. So, for example, we uh, were one of the authors on in HSG 136, the Guide to Workplace Transport, which is the, the HSE guide. So we have experience of doing this kind of work. The issue, of course, is that when you have no legal framework, when you have no guidance, you can have all of the technology in the world, but it's very difficult for somebody who might be a user of that technology to adopt it and move forward with it, because there is always that, that worry that effectively you're having to create your own legal framework for what you might be doing. So we have created this, and hopefully this document has, has been sent out to you as part of the invitation or part of the reminder emails for this event. So this is our code of practice, and this is a draft code of practice. Now, we didn't want this to be the law according to TRL. So this is very much a working document that we have generated with the industry, with the support of industry for industry. So part of the reason for having this meeting today is to give you an opportunity to discuss what we've done and also to start those discussions that will go on into the future. So that where you, when, when you've had a chance to read through and digest the document properly, you can come back to us and say, ah, there's a bit in section 2.5 where, where it isn't clear for my particular application what we ought to be doing. Or you've said that we ought to be doing this, but actually if I'm for my particular application, that maybe doesn't work. So we wanted to create an overarching guideline for all um, off-highway automation applications. So not a specific one. So we are aware that there are a number of very specific guidelines, particularly the Western Australian mining guideline, but there are also in development some specific agricultural ones, both in the UK and uh, in Australia. We are aware of those documents. Um, but this is intended to sit above all of those so that Basically, we can uh, learn from one another, we can learn from different industries and hopefully come up with a, a, a united approach to the way that automation is done uh, in the UK and further afield. Um, the document is intended to be user friendly and it is intended to act as a series of prompts for potential uh, operators, for potential users of off-highway automated systems uh, so that they ask questions, so that they ask questions of manufacturers, so that they ask questions of their uh, of their own uh, management systems, their own health and safety systems, of the design of their sites and so on. So it is intended to be a series of prompts. It doesn't contain terribly many answers, so it doesn't specify that you ought to be using uh, a, a barrier that the vehicle can't get through or uh, a, a geo fence or anything like that. It suggests that those might be possible approaches, but it, it isn't intended to be prescriptive in that way. Um, what is an off highway vehicle and what is the off highway industry? Um, the off highway industry is enormously broad. So I put together this little collage that hopefully illustrates um, the breadth and diversity of the off-highway industry. So we have a lot of the stuff that we might expect to see, the stuff that operates in dirt uh, and very often is painted yellow or sometimes is painted green. So all of those industries along the bottom of my slide here, so agriculture, ground care, uh, quarrying and mining, uh, construction, those kinds of industries. That I guess when, when somebody says off-highway, that's kind of what we're thinking about. But also along the top there, we have some industries that perhaps we don't conventionally consider to be off highway, but actually are. So things like airport logistics, the, the tugs that move uh, aircraft around, uh, the, 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 the vehicles that are used for moving luggage or emptying the toilets, those kinds of things. Um, marine port logistics, uh, indoor logistics, warehousing, forklifts, those kinds of things all come under the remit of this document. Um, so what is an off-highway automated vehicle? So for our purposes, an off-highway automated vehicle primarily operates away from the uh, from open public roads. So that isn't to say that the vehicle never goes onto an open public road because there are many instances uh, where a vehicle will will transport from one place to another via the via the public road. But its primary operation is off the public road that might include closed lanes on public roads. 
So one of the applications that this document might be used for is the, the construction or the maintenance of highways, where of course those vehicles are working on what would normally be a public road, but on a closed lane of it. Um, for vehicles that do both that are, and that are automated both on and off the highway, when they are on the highway, they should be complying with uh, the, the, the CCAV guidance in terms of what on highway uh, automated vehicles should be doing. Um, the vehicle is self propelled. Um, so uh, essentially the vehicle has a way of moving itself from one place to another. Uh, and this is to separate it from things like, well, all of the other machinery that we might find that is in some way automated. So, so we, we could easily have ended up with printing presses and things like that included in this document. So, so a vehicle is a thing that is able to move itself from one place to another somehow. Um, it's land based. We're not interested in uh, flying things. We're not interested in floating things. Um, the vehicle features an automated system that is able to, to, to um, automate part of the operation of the vehicle. And that isn't necessarily the driving of that vehicle. So there will be applications in which a human driver is responsible for the driving task in terms of uh, the, the, the steering, directional control and how fast it's going. But there is an automated system mounted to the vehicle that is doing something else. So think about uh, a hedge brusher, or a, a road sweeper or something like that, where there might be an automated function attached to that vehicle. So it isn't necessarily just the driving task that has been automated. Um, that does imply that things like engine management systems might get included in this. So we have the caveat that that, that automated system must be able to create, must be able to cause direct harm uh, to people. So, OK, your, your engine management system might cause indirect harm, but it's not able to cause direct harm, whereas you know, hitting somebody with with a hedge brusher is able to cause them direct harm. So the question then is, is my robot Hoover, is my Roomba uh, an automated off highway vehicle? Um, and the answer is that, yes, it is, um, with the caveat that our guidance is intended for the workplace. So if it's the one you've got at home, then don't worry about it. If you've got a thousand of these things and you're operating them as a commercial business, then yes, you ought to pay attention to this guidance. Um, you might come to the caveat about is this thing able to cause direct harm? And you might decide for yourself, no, it's not. So I'll ignore all of the rest of the guidance. And that is fine. We're not intending to lay down the law here. We're intending to provide guidance that is helpful for people. Um, I have some edge cases. Just to illustrate um, how broad and diverse this industry might be. So on the left here, we have a Lely um, cattle feeding robot. So uh, this is a vehicle. It's able to move itself around under its own power um, and it has the potential to, to cause harm. If it runs you over or if it crushes you against something, it has the potential to cause harm. So while it isn't a big yellow you know, mine haul truck, this is still an automated off highway vehicle. Uh, on the other side there, we have a robot lawnmower. Same thing applies. It's able to move itself around under its own steam. It's obviously got spinny blades underneath it, so it has the potential to cause harm. Again, coming with the caveat that this is intended for commercial applications. So if you're using it in your garden at home, then feel free to ignore the guidance. But if you're using it on a commercial basis, if you're going around you know, mowing people's golf courses with these things, then there may be something in our guidance that will be helpful to you. Um, to think about on highway automated vehicles, when we start developing an on highway vehicle, um, we have two pieces of guidance that we can use um, pretty much universally. So we have a highway code, we have a set of rules, and we have the assumption that the area in which the vehicle will be operating has been designed for the, for the operation of vehicles. So when I'm on the road, I will never encounter or will almost never encounter uh, a road that has a side slope that is so severe that I'm in danger of the vehicle rolling over. When I get to a set of traffic lights um, and there's a red traffic light, there is some guidance in this document that tells me what to do about that. When I get to a junction, there is some guidance that tells me what to do about that. So there is a set of rules that I can get my vehicle to obey. Uh, and, and that will always work for me. It doesn't guarantee that everybody else will obey them, but never mind. 
And my second rule for on highway vehicles is I can tell the vehicle not to touch anything apart from the road. So I can say you're just not allowed to touch anything uh, and that will always keep you safe. For off highway applications though, first of all, the environment may be unstructured and the environment may be changing and certainly the environment doesn't have a white line painted up the middle of it that I can keep to one side of. So we have an unstructured, you know, unreliable environment potentially. The other thing is that the operation of that vehicle um, might rely on touching things in the environment. For the on highway guys, they can say, well, all we're doing is moving people or we're moving parcels from one place to another and we never have to touch anything. But for off highway applications, we are almost always touching something. We're, we, you know, we're, we're moving containers in a port, we're harvesting things, we're digging things. So we can't have a rule that says don't touch things. And, and that potentially makes our job much, much harder in the off highway environment. In developing our guidance, our starting point uh, were these two documents. So on the one hand, we had HSG 136, uh, the Guide to Workplace Transport Safety, which is the, you know, how do I do non-road vehicles in the workplace guidance? And on the other hand, we had the CCAV uh, Code of Practice for the trialling of automated vehicles, which is intended for on-road vehicles. And in the middle, there is a big gap where well, OK, we've got we, we can do trialing off uh, on the on the highway or we can do operation of non automated vehicles off the highway. But there's kind of nothing in the middle. There's a big grey area. So we set out to fill that big grey area to say what's different about being off highway. And also we were very conscious that the off highway industry is much further advanced in terms of automation than the on highway industry. So there are agricultural applications and mining applications that have been commercially using automated vehicles for 15 or 20 years, whereas there are currently no commercial on highway applications. So, so we didn't want to just say, OK, this might be somebody doing an experiment. We wanted to say this is somebody actually doing a, doing a job of work with their vehicle. The approaches to safety uh, will vary because we are off highway. So if I have a production line and I have a production line robot, um, the easiest way for me to make that system safe is I put a big fence around it and I say you're not allowed to go inside the fence. And there are potential applications off highway where we might be able to take that approach, where we can put a big fence around our site. We don't need any safety systems on our vehicle. We put a big fence around it, say you're not allowed inside the fence. And our safety system is that we monitor that there's never anybody inside the fence. So that might mean that we have interlocks on the gates or we have a CCTV system or whatever. Uh, that obviously isn't possible on the highway. We can't just put a fence around the motorway, but it may be possible for some applications off highway. We wanted to say to people who may be the users of automated vehicles off highway, what changes? So, so what questions do you need to ask? And ironically, one of the big things that changes is human factors. You need to be very conscious of what the people are doing. And that means the training that you give to the people who are responsible for operating the vehicles, whether that is a person who has to sit in the cab and supervise the thing, or perhaps a person who sits at some distance away from the vehicle supervising it. But you also have to give training to people who may be working around the vehicle. So people, even though there's a sign that says you're not allowed to cross the road, People are used to crossing the road because, OK, there's a sign, but the drivers know that everybody does that and the staff will know that they do that. And that's all fine. Many automated vehicles are very deterministic in their approach. And if somebody crosses the road in front of it, then it stops. The system shuts down. We have to do a restart or perhaps it doesn't stop. So we talk a lot about human factors and the training and, and, the, and the way that you might manage your staff as you start to adopt automated systems. Cyber security becomes extremely important. Uh, it, it, it's hard to envisage situations in which you could do a lot of mischief to a human driven vehicle uh, through uh, attacking it in, in, a, in a, a cyber way. Whereas of course, if you've got a 400 ton mine truck running around that is under automated control, the potential for mischief is very high. 
We talk a lot in the document about site design and procedures and, and separation of vehicles and those kinds of things. And depending on your industry, you may look at some of that guidance and think, well, actually, this isn't necessarily relevant to me. That's fine. What we are doing is encouraging you to ask questions about you about the way your operation works. And the final thing that's going to change is the way you manage incidents and the way that you record those incidents. And in particular, the way you analyze incidents. So what in a human driven vehicle may be a very minor issue, uh, a vehicle drives across a curb because the driver took the corner too, too tightly. That's not a systemic failure. Whereas if you have an automated vehicle that has never driven across a curb before and now starts driving over curbs, that potentially is an indication of uh, a systemic failure beginning to develop. OK. I'm going to act as compare during the day. Um, I will hand over to uh, my former colleague, Kit Franklin, uh, up at Harper Adams. Uh, to explain his work on the hands-free farm. Um, I'm conscious of time. We will we'll, we'll press on and we'll deal with questions later on, if you don't mind. Over to you, Kit. Great. Right. Just try and get on. I've just been flicking through my slideshow to remember where I was starting and uh, get back to the beginning. Um, OK, hopefully you're all seeing my screen and I'm coming through loud and clear. Thumbs up. Yeah, and, all good. Yeah, Thank you. Cool. Right on. So, OK, so uh, yeah, my name's Kip Franklin. I'm from Harper Arms University um, and I'm going to talk about the hands free hectare and follow on projects and the learnings from those. And it's a whistle stop tour of the last five years now of work. Um, before I start, I always like to give a context as to why we're bothering. Um, well, Agriculture is the ability for the few to feed the many, I like to say. Um, you can see that in this graph on this first slide, where over the last century, the number of people working on farms in the UK has dropped by 2 million, whilst the population of the UK has increased by 20 million. So 1% of people on, in the UK work on farms, producing the food for the other 99% if we simplify uh, trade and all those things. Um, so we have to use not very many people to make the food for everybody else. Um, now we're having to do that in a climate where that's changing and with a population that is continuing to grow. So we must aim to make farming and agriculture more efficient. Um, and we're doing that by adopting this thing called precision farming. Uh, and the pre precision farming is a process where we observe uh, variation in our crops and animals and livestock and then we try and uh, make changes to uh, reduce that variation control it and ultimately improve yields and at the moment we're doing that on a field by field basis uh, ideally a sub field basis but one day we're hoping to be able to do this uh, at a plant by plant basis so put the right fertilizer at the right place at the right time on the right you know uh, in the right way um, now Whilst we have those aims to feed people in a changing climate, uh, we also have some problems. Uh, one of the problems I, I mentioned already is that uh, reduced rural labour. So, uh, and that reduce, reduction in rural labour has driven us towards ever larger machines, machines that can allow one person to have the output of many people. So if we just take the, the two right hand pictures off this slide, uh, the days of the T20 in the 1950s, a farm that would have been running five T20s with five drivers will now be running a single person on a single tractor uh, for, for want of a bit of context. And um, we have limited time windows. So farms have got bigger, but we still will need to achieve the same amount. So we uh, we've again got bigger machines to try and overcome that uh, that 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 scale that we have to get across the land. Um, one-upmanship is a really big thing, so farmers love looking over the hedge at what their neighbour has and how big and shiny their machinery is. Um, so uh, I like to talk about, you know, if, 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 if your neighbour gets a bigger, shiny tractor, you'll also get a bigger, shiny tractor. And this has been a driver towards bigger machines. Uh, I can talk from experience in this. My farm at home, my brother farms, uh, his tractor size, his average tractor size has grown by 100 horsepower in the last 10 years the job he does is not changed. He's just done it because he likes having bigger tra tractors. Um, the, uh, the problem is these big machines 
give us a, uh, if I get on to the right cursor point, um, give us a lack of resolution for that thing called precision farming I mentioned earlier. So as the machines get bigger, they intrinsically get less precise. Um, they also are damaging our soils. And you can see here, there's a picture of a crop that's completely failed on a headland. And that is purely due to the compaction that large machines have put into that soil. And yes, that's an extreme example, but that compaction is affecting yield across the whole field to some degree. And you can see that in this yield uh, graph I've got on here, where you can see yields used to increase annually until around the year 2000. And since the year 2000, yields on farms have flatlined, all because of these big, large machines that we've had to adopt to cope with not many people. So there is a uh, paradigm going forwards where we go, well, if we didn't need a person sat on every machine, the machine could be, a row, uh, could, could be smaller. We could have loads of small machines acting autonomously. Now, these machines being small, and, and I liken the one I've got a picture of here to a vacuum cleaner, these vacuum cleaner ties machines can go out and be ultimately the most precision farming uh, item you can imagine, treat every plant as an individual thing. They don't weigh very much, we can get rid of compaction. Um, operating in swarms, we can cover the same area. And, uh, and, and we still need someone to manage these. So, so we're maybe upskilling that role. We're taking someone off of a tractor seat and making them a fleet manager of maybe 10 of these vacuum cleaners and all the things that it needs to do to chase after them. Um, which might be a more interesting role for someone of my generation and beyond uh, who don't really want to see in tractor cabs, frankly. Um, smaller vehicles, intrinsically safer. That's ultimately what we're here to talk about today. If I automate the quad track, uh, I have a little story that says, you know, my quad track goes wrong. It drives across the road. It drives through the house. It kills the baby uh, and it doesn't stop to think about it. If my vacuum cleaner goes wrong, it, it reaches the hedge and the story stops. So there's a safety benefit there. Now, the problem with this image is, and this is the image of agricultural robotics that was going around for 15 years, um, is that I don't believe in it. I'm from a farming background and I struggle to believe in this. But what I do believe in is I believe in tractors of the scale of the T20, because I know that we used to farm with these. And I know that if I go to India and China and Turkey uh, and South America, they still farm with tractors that look like this. Most of the world's food is produced with tractors just like this. The, pro the reason we don't in Western Europe and in America is because we don't have enough people. So why don't we just automate tractors that are smaller rather than maybe reinvent the wheel completely and go for vacuum cleaners. Now, no new ideas under the sun. So here's someone back in the 1950s making a robot tractor. Um, the idea then that came from from my frustration and sort of disbelief in the vacuum cleaner theory was could we could we go and do this? Could we automate small but existing farm machinery and and not just make them drive around because lots of people had made tractors drive around on car parks and, and, and rugby pitches, but could we actually farm with them? Uh, I, I teamed up with a colleague called Jonathan Gill, who there's a picture of there, and Jonathan was making drones based on open source technology, um, which was cheap, reliable, and ultimately better than the things I and me and my colleagues were making that were dedicated for farming. So we sort of said, well, could we take the open source tech, put it into a tractor, which no one thought of it when they were designing it. It was designed for flying machines, but could we take it, put it in a tractor and go farming? Um, we did. Uh, this is back in 2016 and 2017. We'd spent four months to turn a tractor into a robot. That's how long it took. That's how good the open source technology was. However, equally, as you watch this video, you'll see that it wasn't perfect. Um, the tractor uh, didn't drive in exactly a straight line, but ultimately we did this quite quickly. Um, we drilled a crop. We rolled the crop, the crop grew. You can see how patchy that crop is. I'm not particularly proud of it now, but I was very proud of it at the time because we were the world's first people to actually do this. Um, there it is, it's full of misses. It's got horrible run lines going here, there and everywhere, but ultimately proved that we could do it. There was no technical reason a tractor couldn't drive itself in a closed sealed environment with a fence around it, with laser system on the front of the tractor for safety, with stop remote stop buttons. Um, you know, we proved we could do it and it got all the way to the point, as you'll see in a second, where we harvested that crop with a combine harvester as well. Try selling someone the idea that you're going to uh, set a combine with a big gobbly front on it, driving around without someone sat on it. Uh, it was a fun sell. Uh, Ianto might have been there in some of those conversations, but we did it um, and we proved it could be done. Now, with a little bit more time and, a, and another dose of not very much funding, I have to say all this was done on less than a quarter of a million quid. For, uh, we did it a second time. And just with a bit more time, we perfected it. And you can see the tractor drove a lot straighter. And hopefully you'll see in this crop, we've got a lot better crop, 
straight driving tractor. Uh, uh, you know, it just shows how quick these things can develop. This was being done by a really small team. There's only three of us working on this. So all of this work was being done for tens of thousands of pounds, not millions, and with three people. Um, and I wasn't really doing much of it because I'm mostly lecturing. Um, we got to the point where we could even unload one uh, the combine into the tractor on the move in the field. Um, and as I say, this is still all based on open source technology, cheap RTK systems that we were bringing in from sort of from China that were sort of costing a couple of grand rather than tens of thousands of pounds. Um, single line lasers uh, in terms of the safety system, all very much done on the cheap just to prove that it could be done. And I've never sworn, uh, I've never I've never stated that we did anything technically marvelous, but what I did, what we did do is we showed it was possible and we and we moved a story forward. Now Based on the work we did, we've we've studied it again. Why is this even? Why are we going to bother doing this at all? Well, we studied the economics of this, and what we're saying is, if we move back to these smaller, lighter tractors, as your farm gets bigger, rather than getting a bigger tractor, you just get multiple units of the smaller ones. And when we've done this analysis and when we've modelled this, the, the the numbers, we can see that we can reduce the cost of production of wheat by twenty to thirty pounds per ton. And critically, that happens from the smallest size farm. So what this does is it enables small farms to be profitable. The, the, the value of a ton of wheat for, for out of interest is £180 at the moment. So you can see if it's costing you 170 quid to grow your wheat, it's not worth doing. Um, so we've made growing wheat worth doing on small farms. Uh, following on from the sort of in-field work we did, we, we did receive some funding to do some CAV on-off highway uh, work where we uh, wanted to move our tractor from the uh, farmyard or what was actually our engineering workshop out to our hands-free hectare field. This would require coping with GPS denied areas. It would it would need to cross a, a closed road and we wanted to see if we could do all those things. Now, Here's a video of what we achieved. You can see gates moving in the background and uh, and the tractor moving. Now the tractor is communicating with the gates. We, we're using uh, LoRaWAN and Zigbee systems to just to, to basically handshake between the gates and the tractor. So it's so it's dealing with its environment. You can see it's going under the trees. Um, you can see it stops when it, it sees a person. And then the it beeps the horn if the sound was on. The person faints, and then the tractor will continue. Um, now, this was all supposed to be done using SLAM and visual odometry and, and and really advanced technologies. But we went to in the order, I think, in around ten companies who all had these jazzy images that showed the pitch like you see on the right hand side. Yet, when you went through the door and you sat in an boardroom table, none of them actually had anything. Lots of companies promising a lot with nothing to show for it. This is back in 2018. Things have changed a little bit, but ultimately we had to do that for ourselves. The plan for the project was go and find the best supplier of a SLAM or visual odometry system and apply it to our machine. By the end of the project, we ended up just doing it ourselves in a very basic way um, because we just couldn't find it anywhere. Um, we did some cool stuff. There's a thing called open pose, open pose, or just take an image and, and find people in it, uh, which is quite useful if you want to find a child in a, in a field of maze, as you can see there. So we did some reasonably interesting stuff, but it was limited to say the least. And we were never hoping we are we're systems integrators. We're not systems developers. And ultimately, the systems to integrate weren't out there at that point. Moving on from that, we are now doing a thing called Hansfree Farm. Hansfree Farm, as it says on the tin, is, is a farm. It's bigger. We've got 35 uh, hectares of land. I'll show you that in a second. And um, um, we're trying to answer some of the bigger questions. How do we deal with swarming vehicles? How do we maybe replenish those vehicles? How do we monitor the crops? How do we get to and from the fields? How do we deal with the public? Um, Here's my 35 hectares. Uh, the blue line you see on that picture is our farm tracks, but they're also public rights of way for dog walkers. So how do we deal with people walking past our fields? How do we deal with a footpath that goes straight across the middle of the field that's called Paws Land? Um, so, so interesting questions. Do we do we monitor the footpaths? Do we when someone walks into the field? Do we shut all the tractors down until the until the person's passed? Do we apply some some logic and say, well, if the tractor's driving away from the footpath, it can continue. But if it's driving towards the footpath, it should stop. Um, do we not do anything? And do we rely on the safety systems that are on the tractor completely? 
there's a whole lot of questions here to ask. Um, ultimately, we, we pre-plan our routes. Um, so we produce route plans and we can do things like avoid poles. So this is our field called Pawsland. There are six telegraph poles and two manhole covers in this field. And we have route plans that avoid those poles and they avoid them in beautifully geometric ways, much better than I can do as a driver myself. Um, and I have no fear that when my tractor goes out into the field, it will miss the poles. It will miss it by the exactly same margin every time because we're on 20 millimeter accurate RTK. Um, if something did go wrong, if our tractor strays more than 20 centimeters from its predetermined path, it will stop. If it decided not to stop, which it then has, it still has its LIDAR on the front. So it will be, it will see the hedge and stop at the hedge. And, and at the moment we're, we're obviously monitoring it as well, because this is research purposes. Here's a video of what this looks like. And, and, and really visually nothing's changed. Um, things have changed. This is now working with a commercial company called FarmScan rather than, uh, the drone technology we have started with. So there is a change under the hood, but really it doesn't look much different. We've got a tractor, we've got a traditional looking tractor with traditional looking implements, driving across the field, doing the job they're supposed to do. But you can see the scale of this field is now a lot bigger and the size and the shape we have, we don't have a square, it's not square, it's not flat. And we're dealing with uh, GPS dropout when the trees get in the way and all those sorts of things. Uh, and this is some work that was done back in November to establish a crop. And this field we're looking at here is now uh, sort of knee height in wheat um, and is looking really good from a cropping point of view. So uh, an implication of this then is, or in, in terms of my industry, is that in agriculture, there is a whole new industry coming here. Um, we're not the only people saying it. Goldman and Sachs, uh, I think, were looking at the work we were doing here at Harper Adams when they wrote this report, because it basically talked about the Harper Adams model of things. It was rather than one 600 horsepower, let's have multiple 60 horsepower tractors. Um, and they say this market could be worth, you know, billions of pounds in years to come. Um, what does it look like and who are the people doing it? Well, there's there's the traditional people involved. We've got Kubota, one of the largest tractor manufacturers in the world, making autonomous vehicles. We have startup companies making all different sizes and shapes. So this company called Gus uh, are making uh, orchard sprayers in America and they are shipping multiple units a week. Every week on Twitter, they have a video of a low loader leaving their factory with robots on it. You know, so this is happening. This is this is out there right now. Um, the one at the top right hand corner, Roboti by Agri Intelli, is a is a sort of field robot. You can strap different implements to it. It can go weeding, it can go drilling. Um, and the reason I've included that is because uh, it's actually some Harper students are importing that system into the UK and selling it. So I'm a little bit proud of that, even though I'm sure they've not done any thought about safety, frankly. Um, uh, and then there's some weird quirky startups such as small robot company who are going right back to the, the vacuum cleaner idea at the start and they want to make these really t weird tiny robots for farming and, and fair play to them, they're, they're making progress. Um, my final slide then, um, what are we doing outside of just showcasing these things? Well, um, and what's the sort of safety implications? Well, you can see the photos on the right hand side about how we're, our system works. You know, we're 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 following the government's uh, uh, code of practice on autonomous vehicle trialing. We've got signs up around our environment. We've been to the parish council and told them what we're doing. We engage with every dog walker that walks by um, and generally we get really positive feedback from the public. But but it's all about engagement and communication for us. Um, you know, we've got our laser system on the front of the tractor. We've got our remote kills. In terms of commercially then, well, there is a ISO uh, standard for uh, highly automated agricultural machines, and it's actually under review at the moment. So don't go and look it up because I suspect in a couple of months time it will be refreshed. So look it up then. Um, and obviously it's a fast moving area. So there is a to, to build your autonomous tractor. There is a, a standard there to follow. Um, we as Harper Adams have, have been also looking at a code of practice over the last year and we're working with the British standards uh, to, to bring together industry in the ag sector and farmers and land users, so dog walkers, etc., into a into a board to put together a, a code of practice much the same as we're talking about here today, but but for the agricultural sector. Um, 
we're working with insurers so we have regular meetings with nfu mutual who insure 80 percent of the farmers in this country talking to them about how can they make products that are suitable for autonomous vehicles because they realize they're coming and they, they, they can't just panic and run away from it they have to have to work with it and we've also done some work on cybersecurity as well um, with uh with ncc group um uh, and we've released a white paper on that so Ended up doing all sorts of random things from, from what was just an initial, could we go farming with a robot uh, a few years ago? Um, and that's where I'll finish. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thanks, Kit. That's really interesting. Um, just a couple of parish notices. So the first one is to say we are whistling through, but if you want to ask questions via the, the chat feature in Teams, then we can kind of deal with questions via text as, as, as we're going along. And the second thing to say is that the meeting is being recorded. So we obviously got the, the permission of all of the speakers, but, but if you uh, verbally ask a question and come on camera, uh, bear in mind that you will be recorded and that that recording will be made public eventually. Um, we're moving on next then to uh, Blackwell Earth Moving. Uh, we're joined by Neil Fraser and Richard Austin. Uh, to talk about the work that they did uh, in a, a trial uh, a couple of years ago uh, with an automated uh, uh, articulated dumper. So I'll hand over to Richard and Neil. Yeah, um, thanks. The PowerPoint's just uploading. So thanks, Richard. Uh, just whilst PowerPoint uploads, that's, that's the first time I've seen Kit's presentation, uh, and it's remarkable, actually, the, the similarities between the uh, um, the agricultural sector and the, the construction, particularly the heavy earth moving sector. Um, I've always said we're, we're quite um, similar to farmers, it's just we, we move the soil rather than farm the soil. So just whilst I wait for this to load up. So um, as Ian uh, Into said in his introduction, both Richard and I are from Blackwell Earth Moving Limited. Blackwell Earth Moving Limited are uh, uh, very long established. We were established back in 1956 and built the uh, uh, earthworks for the first section of the M1. Uh, very long established earth moving specialist working principally in the construction sector in the UK. Um, we, back in 2019, um, completed the earthworks for, for a very large highway scheme for Highways England um, on the A14, the improvement of the A14 between Cambridge and Huntingdon. And, and as part of that scheme, we, we proposed the trial of a, of a large, so when, when I say large, it was a, a dump truck weighing about 70 tonnes, it was 40 tonne capacity, 30 tonne um, unladen, so about 70 tonnes greater weight, um, off-road articulated dump truck, which really is the benchmark unit in, in um, heavy earth moving, certainly in the UK and Europe, if not around the world. Um, we secured designated funding from Highways England, to say Highways England were a client, we were supported by uh, um, the main contractors on the scheme, the integrated uh, delivery team, um, in our endeavours. And really what we wanted to show was that we could take um, what we understood and, and we knew, and Richard, as you will hear, is, is joins us from Australia. Uh, Richard had experience of mining in Australia, so we knew that automated equipment was, was in use in the mining sector. We wanted to show that it could be used in the construction sector as well. It hadn't been used in the construction sector, not just in the UK, um, but but anywhere in in the world to this day, so to this scale, so it was very much it was a trial, but it was a trial in some scale, um, and it was to, to show the industry. But there was absolutely no reason why this couldn't be done. The technology was available, particularly in the on road marketplace, as we've heard. Um, why can't it be transferred? Our view was there's no reason why it couldn't be transferred to, to the off road marketplace. It's important to stress that we did this trial as an agnostic trial, so. Um, we sought technology from around the world, and as Richard will explain, we, we had a very international supply chain from, from states in South Africa um, using um, technology equipped to a Japanese dump truck. It was agnostic in the sense that it could be equipped with technology that we, we sought, could be equipped to any equivalent dump truck. Um, so it was it was independent of, of the dump truck manufacturers themselves. I know Volvo on laser, they, they have a very well developed um, automation program as well, which I'm excited to, to receive an update on. But it, this was independent. This was from an end user. We are an end user. We wanted to show what um, the possibilities were with this equipment in the UK. 
Part of what was driving as well, this, this is um, something which is very close to the industry at the moment, is um, there is a skill shortage, there is a labour shortage, um, pretty much, um, again, similar to as Kit was describing in agriculture, um, but a very real and a very contemporary labour shortage in, in UK civil engineering, particularly in the earth moving specialism. Um, there's there's a, a, a very predictable and increasing demand for heavy earth moving services for the next 20 years in the UK. Um, and the industry is going to have to upscale considerably to meet that demand. One of the challenges is going to be finding sufficiently skilled and trained people. So we, we suggested, well, let, let's see if we can't reduce that reliance um, on, on people, uh, not replace them, but reduce the reliance by, by the use of automated equipment. Um, I think it's important to flag, and, and Richard will explain this in, in the detail of his presentation, but um, as I said, it was only a trial, but it was a trial of a fully automated um, uh, piece of equipment on truck. It wasn't remote control. This is what really impressed me. It wasn't somebody sitting in a, a remote office behind a computer screen driving this piece of equipment. It was fully automated. Um, the trial uh, was, was very successful. We, we um, presented our findings on, on both an industry day um and on a on a national media day and, and it actually garnered a lot of attention believe it or not richard and i ended up on on the um, on the bbc's one show back in in the late summer of 2019 and, and believe you me it's not often that, that a couple of earth movers end up on, on prime time tv we haven't been invited since so so i don't know that most probably speaks volumes but there we are so without further ado um, i'm going to hand you over to richard who will talk you through the trial in more detail all right, thanks, Neil. Um, so our our trial really goes back to some of those those comments that uh, that Yanto had in his introduction, where we were we were looking around at these things, and it's it's clear that the mining industry has been doing this for a while. In fact, outside of aerospace and and the military, the mining industry really is the is the leader in autonomy. Um, there were there were some experiments back in the early 90s with Carnegie Mellon University in the states attempting to to create autonomous autonomous diggers, and then really in 1995 onwards, uh, full full autonomy in the mining industry and the open cuts it sort of took off. And and really by 2000 onwards. If you're looking to build a large scale open cut mine, it needs to it needs to be autonomous to complete. Um, you know, the large scale stuff in Australia from the Pilbara, even the even the haul out trains are fully autonomous now. So it was really a question of can that stuff be transported into the civil en engineering uh, engineering sort of context? Um, the big question was, of course, is OK, well, even if the kit works, how do you regulate it? How, how does it how does it get uh, how does it get looked after? Because as Yanto said, there is no regulation. So the, the 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 reason why Highways England and Designated Funds funded it was the same reason they funded Yanto, and it's all part of the same funding, which was let's grab the equipment, let's let's bolt it onto a truck, let's bring it over, and and let's see if it works. Um, and in doing so, can we see whether the the guidance the safety cases and all of this work that's been done in the mining industry can it be simply applied to to civils so that's what it was about it, it wasn't a production trial it was it was a a case of does a piece of mining equipment belong on a civil site so to understand whether it belongs or not you have to understand a little bit about how they work um there's Originally, Caterpillar and Komatsu were the, the two people that made them. Um, then there was ASI Robots, who, who we, we went with. Their, their, their equipment is, is agnostic, as Neil says, so they make all the uh, the gubbins, the sensors, the, the boxes and whatnot that you strap onto the truck and it can turn any truck into a robot. Um, Volvo also have a, have, a, uh, have, a, have a program. But they, they all work the same way fundamentally, and that is that the trucks and vehicles and everything else are dumb. They're really not intelligent at all. Um, in fact, the vehicles, all they do is follow the paths that they're given. So the central computer tells them drive here and they dutifully drive there. And then they have something on board called ODAS, which is object detection and avoidance system. So they've got to be aware enough to see if there's something in front of them or around them or, or something's going on that the central computer didn't know about and take appropriate safe action. So that's really the limit of autonomy on the vehicle itself. 
The central unit, on the other hand, is extremely intelligent. The central unit controls everything, not just one vehicle, it controls them all. And the central computer on all of these mining systems is is essentially playing a computer game. It has the uh, it controls the site via maps, so everything's relying on on a high precision GPS, so GPS to within an inch. And the central system is where you tell it what your site looks like. You tell it where the trucks can drive, where they can't drive, how fast they're allowed to drive, what they're supposed to be doing, whether they're supposed to be tipping, whether they're supposed to be hauling, if there's an excavator, what it's doing. All these sorts of things is all managed in this central system. So the mining system is very much, you know, Yante talked about structured sites and unstructured sites. The mining systems all make the site extremely structured. So you have this central repository of maps, which gives you the structure to the site. You tell the computer what it is you can and can't do anywhere that that finds itself. And then it simply runs the equipment around the site to try and achieve your aims. The key point about this is that the site itself is autonomous. So not only is the truck deciding how it's going to steer itself and drive itself, but fundamentally the central computer is actually doing things like queuing up trucks and saying, actually, I want you to wait for a bit because there's no 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 space for you downrange. So the the actual work site is autonomous as well as the uh, the vehicles themselves. So how did it go? Well, it actually went really well, <laughs> as Neil said. So it, it must be stressed that this is old equipment. We 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 got it in a box. Uh, it was the 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 uh, uh, a set of trial equipment that had been developed by Anglo American. Um, seven or eight years before we got a hold of it. It had been used in a mine in South Africa for four years, uh, re rehabilitating a mine site. Then it had got shoved in a, in a box for storage for four years, and then we got a hold of it. So it was deliberately old equipment that had been used before to keep prices down. But it still worked. It worked really well. Um, if anything, the ODAS was actually a little bit too sensitive, uh, which we'll get onto in a minute. What was really interesting was the control software. This is what we really wanted to look at was, is the control software suitable? Because in a mining context, you, you have a whacking great hole in the ground for an open cast mine. It, it might take you 25, 30 years to dig it. And you might only have three or four different stockpiles, you know, an overburden stockpile, a primary crush stockpile, and, you know, a couple of others that the accountants want you to separate out. Um, as a result, your mining trucks are doing the same thing every day, every night for the next 10 years. Whereas on a civil site, you might be changing paths sometimes within the day. You know, what you're doing in the morning might not be what you're doing in the afternoon. So one of the chief things that we were testing was how easy and how controllable and how safe the change of the maps are. And that's something that's really important to consider when talking about safety of autonomous systems. It's not just the safety of the robot driving down the road. It's the human factors of how safe it is to control the site, how easy it is to change a map, how well controlled a map change is, whether anybody can change a map, whether in changing the map you've introduced new hazards, all these sorts of controls. It's really about site control, less about robotics. Uh, turned out they were really great, really good systems. And the biggest thing that came out of it was which we were really looking to look is were the regulations appropriate for use? And in our view, yes. And so we recommended to Yanto that the West Australian Department of Mines get adopted and, and be used as the basis for his work, which which he took under advisement and I think I think had some agreement with us. Um, and the ISO standard uh, 17 757, I think it is, which uh, is is where the mining mining uh, equipment is developed to. Again, we, we we believe that's an appropriate standard for the control of the, the machines themselves. So I'll show you a little bit. This is what we did. So this, as you can see, it's driving by itself. Now I must admit, uh, emphasise that truck is deciding how to drive along the path it's been given. So the central computer's told it to drive along here, and it's it's just doing its thing. It's it's deciding how and when to turn the wheel and how and when to how and when to turn and drive. And of course, we've told it to run over this uh, obstacle and we've not told it the obstacles there. And this is the key fail safe is ODAS. Your, your system has to be able to detect and stop. And it did repeatedly. Um, in fact, we never managed to get it to drive over anything. We, we tried we tried again and again and again to trick it into driving over something, never managed it. And you can see that the system is capable of quite detailed manoeuvres. 
and so we deliberately gave it a, a place to drive there, as you can see at the end, um, that simulates some of the difficulties, the, the constraints of a civil site as opposed to a mining site. So key learnings then, as is, like I said, we were testing an old system, as is, yeah, it's fine, you can use them. The, the mining kit is good enough to use in a civil site. Provided you plan the site around the autonomy, that's a key. That the site has to be planned around the autonomy. You could not take one of these systems, or it would be foolish and foolhardy to do so, um, and and throw it onto a traditional earth moving site or a traditional civil site with uh, with people going everywhere. Not, not going to work. Um, the big out th uh, outcome as well is Wi-Fi network quality is king. So the way all these systems work remember what i said at the beginning is you've got a central computer talking to all the trucks well one of the key key safety cases that's built into them is if the wi-fi drops out even for half a second boom, stops the whole thing so it has what's called a heartbeat signal which is just pinging away in the background and as soon as the truck can't hear the uh, wi-fi sending out that signal it just turns itself off so it's absolutely critical that you've got a really strong wireless network which is is problematic on civil engineering sites um, generally speaking, the autonomous systems for the mining industry are less aggressive than a human would be. And the main reason is, is because mines, as you would expect, you've got the time and the space to make things nice and big and wide and gentle. You know, typical gradients down into an open pit might be 10 degrees, uh, 10 percent, sorry. Um, you know, and if it's a 400 ton dump truck, naturally the haul paths are nice and wide and open. Civil sites, a bit more constrained it's something to think about and something that's a bit easy. And the general takeaway is with the systems as they currently are, and that's a big important thing as they currently are, getting them to stop is really easy. That, that, that's what they do by default. They're, they're very, very safe. What's challenging is to get them to go <laughs> because they will, they will always default to a safe space, which is just stop. So the development challenges that we see to really bring these things forward, and these are development challenges that I must emphasize have happened between when we the kit that we were using was developed and now so these have already happened in the past tense they just haven't necessarily made it to market first thing price so the lidar sensor was strapped to our site when it was struck when it was new it was about eighty five thousand us uh at sixteen thousand channels a current one you can pick up with one hundred twenty eight thousand channels and it sees in full color and it's only 12 grand um and there's solid states coming to the market for about 700 bucks uh, Wi-Fi network, there's a move on within the next version of ISO 17757, the, 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 the standard for autonomous earth moving equipment in the mining, um, that is to provide for relaxed autonomy. So instead of having no more than half a second dropout, move to make the trucks and the diggers and everything else a little bit smarter and let them operate on their own for up to 20 seconds. Uh, that will be an absolute game changer when that comes, and it is coming. It, it, people are developing that as we speak. Um, so people like ASI and so forth, and I'm sure our friends of Volvo are all working on that. When that gets here, obviously your network doesn't have to be quite so stable. It means you can roll it out in, in places that, that are a little bit more tricky. Uh, the ODAS, again, our system was pretty crude, uh, it was pretty old. They have to have fewer false positives if you're going to roll them out in anger, but that's what the industry has been working on for the past 10 years. Uh, some, some of the newer stuff where you've got uh, neural networks used as image classifiers and uh, full HD uh, LIDARs where it's not only the LIDAR channels, but also the... Um, uh, but also the color channels are fed to the image classifiers. Uh, some of those things are the closest to magic that you could ever ever hope to see. You know, can can identify basically anything. Uh, the ninety nine point nine 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 percent accurate. Um, regulations. This is the last one. So the first three are all being dealt with, and they're all primarily being dealt with by the automotive sector. The automotive sector has pumped huge quantities of money, vastly more than we could ever afford in earth moving, um, into precisely this challenge. And they continue to do so. You know, Google with its WIMO platform pumping in billions. Uh, Tesla obviously is pumping in billions. Um, you know, Daimler is pumping in billions. Every single player is pumping in nine figures and more. But none of that would be worthwhile if we didn't have some regulation to say, OK, yes, we can pick these things up. Yes, we can buy them. Yes, we can put them to work. And uh, that's what today is. And that's what Yanto's uh, fantastic work has, has helped for. It's a, it's a tick in that box as well. 
So the takeaways from our trial and, and, and from a consideration of it is that, yeah, the mining kit is ready to use now, just straight up as is right now, you can use it. The regulations are fine, just follow the mining codes of practice, they're good to go. Um, they will only get better because the key technology coming out of the automotive sector is amazing. Um, the price is dropping precipitously. You know, the last 10 years, you've seen orders of magnitude reductions in the sensors and so forth. So the next generation of this equipment that comes out, it's no longer going to be bespoke. It's going to be absolutely, absolutely core to people's businesses. And most importantly, where we are right now is we're ready to start using it. So if anyone out there has a, a project, a big project where program is the driving concern, and that's the key, because the thing that autonomy lets you do is it lets you run at night. You can, uh, you can, you can get the job done faster. Uh, so if you've got a big project out there where programs are driving concern, you've got big lumps of muck to shift, um, you know, it's a reasonably isolated site, and we can we can do those things to do with, um, you know, designing the the site around the autonomy. Then, uh, yeah, the robots are ready. Autonomy's here, and it, it could be you. So, um, thank you very much for your time. Thank you uh, very much to TRL for 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 taking this up because because like I said, without the regulation in place, none of these products can be brought to market. But they're there, they're ready, and uh, we want to use them. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, chaps. Um, so we have a break now until 10 past one. I'm, I'm happy to deal with questions over this break if, if people want to ask any questions. Uh, or if not, we'll, uh, we'll resume in uh, nine minutes or so. I'm taking silence as a good thing. So. I had a question, Yanto, to Ryan. Sure. Um, you know, from the examples put forth, uh, great presentations, by the way, um, super presentations. The with re both the agricultural case study and the earth moving example rely on Wi Fi technology. <clears throat> uh, and then there's this, this concept of a connected site. What other, you know, Wi Fi restricted by range to a certain extent? What other are there other potential communications technologies that would support perhaps the latencies that your and the deterministic um, nature of your communications? So, if, if shall I jump straight in the answer? Is that right? Yeah, yeah, go for it. Yeah, so we started off on Wi-Fi as as was on my slides, um, and we were limited basically to 120 meters range, and the furthest point in our field was 100 meters, so that was spot on. Um, as it is now, we are actually on cellular. So now we're, we're out in the Hansbury farm and I probably yeah, should change the slide somewhere and make that clear. But yeah, now now we're on 4G um, SIM cards and, and basically transmitting data via that. Um, uh, we don't have where on our old system, we did have a permanent connection over the Wi-Fi. Now with the cellular, we don't. We're just sending messages as and when we need. But we do have a separate safety system that is always in contact. Um, so we can always kill the vehicle, which is done on the heartbeat type system. Um, but the control and command and upload, we're now doing via 4G. And we were involved with a 5G project that I skipped from my presentation for timeliness. I was involved with a 5G project that ultimately wasn't very successful in 2018, where we were part of 5G Rural First, massive consortium, 30 companies. We were just the use case. It was a year project. We were expecting to receive our 5G equipment six months in and we received it two weeks from the end. And sure enough, we didn't get to do much with it. And it was all basically it was all just a bit too early. And I think if that project ran again now, we could have a 5G system working quite reasonably. Yeah. And just just to add to that, that that bit I was talking about with the move to relaxed relaxed autonomy so maybe up to 20 seconds is is the the time frame being branded around that's what that's for is so that you're not bound to a, a wi-fi network anymore you know or, or local area network i mean it doesn't have to necessarily be be the wi-fi um the wi-fi signal it could be something else but the 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 as soon as you move to gsm um the latency gets too high for the current 
current system design. The current system designs for the mining systems is that it, the, the, the equipment is hard bound in real time to the central computer. Um, and in order to move away from that model, you do need to make the pieces of equipment a little bit more intelligent. Um, so yeah, it, it's it's that relaxed relaxed autonomy is the next step. So this is this is really interesting. So where we started, we had all the intelligence, as it were, on the tractor. We we upload a route plan, but the tractor decides how it's getting around that route plan. What we were doing in the 5G project was 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 flipping that and going to where you are. In the whole point in the 5G project was to take the clevers and put it onto the cloud or put it onto edge computing. Um, so it was running on a server and making the, the, the tractor more stupid. Um, so that's interesting that we're trying to go the other directions yep. here. Um, and our reason for doing that is in order to try and make the, 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 the vehicles that go in, that, you know, essentially implements and vehicles on farm as, as cheap as possible. Because the problem is we have an awful lot of implements on farm that do two weeks of work a year. So if you have to make them supercomputers, and they're only worked for two weeks a year, that's pretty inefficient. If we can use 5G with low latency, and um, we can move to edge computing, then we can keep the price of the implements down. And that that's that was our ambition uh, with that project. Um, I can see a hand up from uh, Jayakumar Barath. Do you... Yes, hi, good afternoon. This is uh, Bharat Jayakumar from, uh, from Bosch. Um, I know a couple of the speakers here. Thank you very much. Excellent presentations. And uh, also, uh, Richard and uh, Neil, thanks for the uh, uh, your video. Very, very interesting. Uh, some of the points that were made um, regarding sensor and sensor costs, um, uh, I again, completely agree. I think those need to come down. And um, I, I'm not sure if you're aware, we continue to work taking some of our automotive radar, for example, in ultrasonics at Bosch and trying to bring autonomy for ag and uh, construction so happy to connect if that's of interest uh, we, we're building on some projects and also this this uh, session very interesting thank you also to trl because then it it sends that um, message that this is really important in terms of bridging the skills gap and safety are obviously as as a key part so um, very good to, to hear this see the demonstrations and uh, would be happy to to show what work some of some of the um, um, autonomous um, wheel loaders that we've done worked on to to show that to the audience at a at a time that's suitable or um, separately um, and how we are integrating those sensors onto machines but uh, thank you um, and uh, appreciate the uh, the discussion brilliant thank you thank you for that um uh, an observation from nick finley hi nick nice to see you um it says you should speak to millbrook about 5g network and systems uh, all the off highway tracks here have 5g connectivity um and then there's a question for richard from mark sears uh, he says within the flexibility of off highway industry and earth moving industry do you see remote control machines being being employed as soon as possible and then full autonomous following later yeah. It's a, it's a great question and it's a perennial debate. So um, my, my opinion is a bit of both. So the, the autonomous systems are by nature remote control. So the, the way it's working is, the, is the, the truck itself is drive by wire anyway. So when you sit inside that bell dump truck, for instance, and you thought there was a command, so turn the wheel, you're not you know physically connected to the machine. You're sending a signal to the computer and the computer interprets that and drives the truck where it wants to go. Um, so really and truthfully, you could take the person out of the cab and set them up with a PlayStation wheel and from the point of view of the truck, it's literally no different. So the truck is already remote controlled. That's the thing to realize. So so all earth moving equipment for the past five or six years, certainly, I, I, I don't think anybody's selling anything that's not drive by wire anymore. Um, it's all remote controlled. It's just the bloke remote control of it happens to be sitting in the cab. Um, so it's very, very easy, actually, to remote control it from afar. You just have a system and, and, and port in the signal. So the way I think it's going to work is, is autonomy should be there to run the fleet. Uh, there's no benefit to autonomy if you still need 10 guys for 10 trucks, no matter how, how nicely their, their accommodations. However, with autonomous systems, you're always going to get edge cases where either the truck gets stuck or you need to get it into a place where you haven't been able to set up a map or you need to get it out of a place where the map is there, but something's gone wrong. Um, and so I think teleoperation will be extremely useful, much the same way as IT support is extremely useful. 
So we don't have one IT support guy per laptop out in the field. You have one IT support guy for 20, 30, 100, depending on the size of the scale. So I could see teleoperation being a support service where you have a certain number of remote operators ready to jump into uh, numbers of trucks, diggers, dozers, etc. cetera. Um, but where each person is responsible for a number of items of equipment. And indeed, that's the model that's being followed in the mines in Australia. So if, if you look at, say, Rio Tinto's efforts in the Pilbara, et cetera, um, that, that, that's the model they follow is they have a small number of teleoperators who can jump in and out as required, but basically the system runs itself. Brilliant and, and bang on time as well. So we're going to move on uh, to start digging into the, the, the details of the code of practice itself. Uh, so we have Peter Ball, um, who is uh, one of the authors of the document uh, at TRL. So I'll hand over to Peter. Thank you, Ianto. Hopefully you guys are seeing my screen now. Uh, with that. Yeah, we're oh, well, Brilliant. So yes, as Ianto says, I am one of the co-authors of the Code of Practice, and I'm going to be taking you through one of the content sections um, that we've created with a bit of an explanation of where it came from and then giving you an overview of, of what that content is. So to give you a bit more context, we have two main sections within the code of practice, which is section two and section three. Section one is simply our introduction and scope. So section two is concepts to support safe implementation of OHAVs um, or off-highway automated vehicles as it stands for. And this is essentially teaching users concepts that are relevant throughout the implementation and use of off-highway automated vehicles. And then section three, which my colleague Mark will be taking you through later in this webinar, is the kind of nitty gritty specifics of implementation. So where did these concepts come from? How did we uh, come up with them? So we performed a industry stakeholder engagement and these concepts were things that kept coming up um, across the stakeholder engagement from a, a wide number of people of things that they themselves had found were useful. And they also have come somewhat from TRL's uh, prior experience from on highway automated vehicles. So there are three, three key concepts within section two and they are the Operational Design Domain, or ODD, uh, Systems Approach, and Safety Protections. So if we roll straight into Operational Design Domain. So I imagine a lot of people here will have heard this before, but I think there will probably be many who've, who've never seen it before. Um, so it's defined in, in this document as the operating conditions under which a given driving automation system or vehicle feature is specifically designed to function. So in other words, it's a full description of the circumstances in which the vehicle can safely operate. And it should be noted that it's specifically talking about the, the automated systems on the vehicle and how and when they can operate. So what you use this for is to define the use case of the vehicle and it allows implementers to safely design their work sites and activities around the vehicle. So a good example of one of the considerations included in the ODD would be the terrain that the automated system can perform on. So for example, can it run on dirt? Can it run on asphalt? Can it run on muddy fields? Can it run on snow? And again, it's worth noting that this doesn't necessarily mean um, what the vehicle can and can't do. So the vehicle may, may well be able to run on snow, but perhaps the automated system does not have that capability. And if it were to snow, then a human driver may need to uh, take over. Another example of this was weather uh, and in particular visibility due to weather. So the automated system may have cameras, may have LIDAR, may have radar, and they may all be um, susceptible to different levels of light. They may not be able to uh, um, work properly in the rain or snowfall or fog and the ODD will will tell you this. It's also worth noting that typically the term ODD has been used in the on highway sector where it describes the limits of automated driving tasks but obviously 
off highway machines don't just drive around they quite often do other operations in the case of a dump truck would be to dump the load they're carrying in a specific place so for the purposes of this document we have expanded uh, ODD to include both driving and operational tasks which may be performed by an automated system so the second concept which is covered in section two is systems approach so as you begin implementing automated vehicles you may find that it leads to more interactions with the wider system and therefore a, a, a bigger wider systems approach may be required um, for implementing and using these vehicles it also leads to more inter interdependencies across the system and as a result uh, users need to understand how these different elements of the system affect each other so a good example is connected vehicles which may now be speaking to each other um, and you've also got super uh, supervision systems so they may have a uh, overall view of all the vehicles so there is a key benefit to be able to um, for the system working together and that it's a system can work towards a common goal. So you can have a fleet of faultless trucks all being instructed by a central command unit. So they're all doing the same thing. They all have the same common goal as opposed to traditional systems with individual drivers who have their own directives. Another benefit of a system a wide approach is that the system can see everything and adapt as a whole. So if one of these vehicles comes across an obstruction in the road, it can instantly alert all of the other vehicles and the main system, and the system can adapt to avoid that obstruction. However, if you have an interconnected system, one limitation of this is that a single failure within the system can break the whole system. So if this command unit breaks for whatever reason, then all these fault lifts don't know what they're doing. However, this can be prevented by implementing redundancies in your system. So for example, a, a backup command unit, which can take over if the first one malfunctions. The final concept which uh, we're introducing in this code of practice is safety protections. So in a traditional vehicle, the operator is the safety protection because they have responsibility for the vast majority of operational tasks. So essentially it is their job to monitor the situation around them and to act accordingly. So for example, if someone's driving along in a tractor, a child walks out in front, the operator is assessing the situation, they will notice the child, they will stop, they won't hit the child. However, once you begin implementing automated systems, those systems are taking control of some of the operations. But the question is, do, does that then become the safety protection? So what we're essentially saying is that each operation now needs to be evaluated and a safety protection applied so that we know who or what is in control of that operation and who's in control of um, any safety measures which may need to be implemented. So in the case of the child walking out in front of a tractor, if we assume this tractor is automated, it has auto steer and has speed control. So the operator is not actually driving the machine. They're doing something else. Perhaps they're um, adjusting an implement which is attached to the tractor, which is plowing, for example. We need to decide what happens, who, decide, who is looking out for this child and who's going to press the big red button. So it could still be the driver. Even though they're not the one driving, they may have the responsibility to be uh, mindful of the situation, see the child, hit a big red button, the tractor stops. Alternatively, you could have sensors on the tractor which can see this child when it comes out and automatically stop itself. Or you could implement your wider system, build a nice big fence around it, the child never gets there in the first place. However, a lot of the people we talked to during the stakeholder engagement said, however big or strong your fence is, someone's always going to get in at some point. So it may be required to have uh, redundancies in your system. So you may need to have multiple safety protections uh, for a certain operation, depending on the potential risk um, associated with it. 
But the key takeaway here is that you now need to think about these things because now that you're automating certain features, you need to think about whether an operator might be involved or whether the system needs to be involved or and specifically how the system will provide that safety protection. Another example of this, which is maybe not quite so obvious, if we take this example where we have a fleet of airport baggage handlers and they are controlled by a central system uh, and they're running around, but it has begun snowing and the operational design domain for these uh, vehicles says that they can't operate in snowfall. So the safety protection required here is that we need some way of knowing that there's snowfall so that we can alert the system and the vehicles can uh, halt their operations safely. So one option could be that the vehicles themselves have sensors on them which detect the snowfall, tell the vehicle that it's no longer safe um, and it's reached the limits of its operational design domain and that it needs to halt operations. Another option could be to have a supervisor who is monitoring the general situation, sees that snow started coming down and alerts the system. Or you could have a sensor on the control system uh, tower itself, and that essentially senses for the whole system. As soon as it detects it, shuts the entire system down. So again, the key point is that now that there is automation involved, it's not quite so simple. There's not an operator anymore who just does all these jobs and ensures that the vehicle is operating in a safe way. You now need to look at each of these operations and apply a safety protection to ensure that it, uh, the operation is, is still uh, safe. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Um, I'm, I've got nine minutes left, so if there's any questions um, on that section specifically, uh, we will happily take any now or we can move on um, to our next guest speaker. Brilliant. Thanks, Peter. Um, I, I note the contribution from Alan Burrows uh, and the, the link to the Molly problem. Uh, I, I recommend anybody uh, anybody go and have a look at that, uh, preferably after our meeting. Um, I think one of the interesting uh, problems that arises, and, and it arises on highway as well, uh, but particularly off highway, is we, we have an ODD that says this vehicle is able to operate during the day, which is fine because that's predictable, uh, but it's not able to operate during rainfall. Uh, and it is able to operate on 45 degree slopes. So you've got an 80 ton haul truck and it's halfway up its 45 degree slope and it starts to rain. So at that point, what do you do? Because the vehicle is told that it's got to stop if, if it starts raining. Uh, but of course, if it stops halfway up that 45 degree slope, um, it's now stuck and can't restart on that 45 degree slope. So your human operator would say, well, I know the rules say that I'm not allowed to operate uh, in rainfall because that's what the rule says. But I also know that I'm stuck if I stop here. So I'll carry on and I'll stop at the top of the slope. Whereas, of course, the, the machine doesn't necessarily know that it can break that rule. So I think there is there is some interesting t discussion to be had, and it equally applies to uh, to on highway vehicles about, OK, when is it OK to operate outside of the ODD and for how long can you bend those rules for the sake of uh, getting the vehicle into a safe position? Uh, I don't see any any hands up or any questions, any questions or comments? Maybe just a quick comment from from us, Jan. So it's um, with these ODDs. One one of the key messages that I think we would all agree on is people need to understand that the. Or it would be a great takeaway for people to understand the ODAS systems on autonomous equipment should be thought of as PPE, in that it's the last line of defence. Um, your hierarchy of controls should always be what Peter's talking about, you know, making the site safe and also, you know, using administrative controls to make sure things don't happen. Um, from, from our point of view with heavy earth moving equipment, we would consider the fact that the ODAS system has been triggered at all to be a failure and a failure of administration and a failure of safety. Uh, 
the ODAR systems are there if the worst happens to prevent the very worst happening. They are not there to provide safety of yourself, people or others. Um, if you put an autonomous system in to the field that is relying on the ODAS system as its primary control, um, well, I don't want to be near it. <laughs> Um, as good as they are, you know, I mean, we, we never managed to trick our truck into running anything over, but I still wouldn't want to bet my life on it. <laughs> yeah, it's a similar concept to personal protective equipment, isn't it? If, yeah. if it's reaching the point where the only reason you didn't get hit in the eye is because your safety glasses were there, it's, you know, certainly a near miss at that point, and really a failure of the safety system that should have come before it. Yeah. I, I think the other point to make, and this, this goes back to the point that Ian said was making about well, um, what happens if the haul truck has to, uh, to stop when it starts raining and it's midway up a, a, a long steep grade. Um, there's not actually that much difference here between a, an automated scenario and a, a conventionally operated, i.e. human operated scenario because but the industry now is, is so heavily regulated and so heavily prescribed that we have to give very, very prescriptive and definitive rules and instructions to the operators such that the, the discretion of the, the uh, which comes from the human being, the discretion of the operator is far less now than it was even a couple of years ago, let alone 10 or 20 years ago. So if if there's a situation where the site has a rule that uh, the equipment must stop when it starts raining, then you wouldn't expect the operator to be able to use his or her discretion to um, to interpret that rule to I will get to the top of the grade. Um, so really the rule should be, and this is the rule that we would give our operators, um, is stop as soon as it is safe to do so following the onset of rainfall, but for instance, don't stop on an uphill grade where it's not safe to do so because you won't be able to restart. I would have thought that same same criteria could easily be applied to, to a logic control of, a, of an automated vehicle as well. I stop when you detect rain, but not if you're on an uphill or a downhill grade. Yeah, absolutely, Neil. And I, I think the point really, and, and my example is perhaps um, a, um, a little bit um peculiar but the point really is that si the automated systems have no discretion so, so you know the, the the system will do whatever the system has been told to do so as an operator of that system you need to understand what all those rules are so if you've got a system that has been told that if it sees a drop of rain it stops then that's what it's going to do every time. And, and you might, as the operator of that system, find yourself thinking, well, I, want, I wonder why it keeps doing that. That seems like a ridiculous thing to do. But of course, that that's that's exactly what it's been told to do. And it's behaving in, in exactly the, the way that it's been programmed. And you can, you, you know, on highway, we have the same logic that, that we may have an ODD for a vehicle that says, well, you're not allowed to proceed in snow. So, so, so if it starts snowing, you've got to stop. And you're driving along in lane three of the motorway at 70 miles an hour and it sees a flake of snow obviously at that point you don't want the vehicle to stop um you, know, you don't want to stop dead in lane three of the motorway so so at that point you you need um a more flexible odd that says well okay you've gone outside of the um the normal odd but there is an exception to this rule that says you carry on to the next services or the next refuge or you give the if you still have a safety driver, you hand over to the safety driver. But that process of handing over to the safety driver can't be instantaneous. Um, and and the, 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 there's a load of research been done looking at how long it takes a driver to, to re-establish situational awareness. And if you've been sat, sitting there reading your book for the last three hours, and all of a sudden the car wants you to take over, or indeed your truck wants it to take over, it might take you know, a minute or two minutes even to regain situational awareness and to, to the point where you're safe to continue manoeuvring that vehicle. Anyway, we are going to move on now to Giles White from BOMAG um, to talk about automated rollers. Right, mm -hmm. Giles. Let's try sharing the screen and see what happens. 
Sure. So hopefully you can see that okay. We, we yeah, we can see your screen. We can't see you at the moment. I don't know. Yeah, I've just, I've just turned that turned that off because of the bandwidth. <laughs> okay. <laughs> really. Um, John. So my name is Giles White and I'm the key account and technology sales manager for, for BOMAG GB. Uh, over the last few years, we've been working on several technology projects uh, based around the connected job site uh, as well as autonomy. As part of this presentation, I'll be covering the vision of the future as well as where we are now and also the realities of a job site today. In mid 2019, the construction industry and also wider technology providers came together under the Highways England Connected Autonomous Plant Group. The goal to make the site of the future a reality with a truly collaborative approach from all parties. With this bold goal also came a bold statement. The goal is to have autonomous sites as the norm on large sites by 2035. This is a bold goal that can be made a reality by everyone pulling together. The roadmap to cap the cap goal was published in the summer of 2020. Um, some extracts are shown here. The ambitious target and goals along the way are set, were set with key milestones identified. The cooperation of authorities, designers, manufacturers and contractors have made this document possible. To understand the reasoning behind the cap goal, several key benefits were identified. Efficiencies from enhanced con machine control are well documented and adoption is increasing. Quality can be an easy gain uh, as it's not just about a quality job, it is about the reproducibility and consistency of the results. Here, automation can make a big impact, especially with re repetitive tasks. Speed gains in modular and off-site assembly are clear, as well as utilising advanced advanced technology to improve the efficiency on site and also reduce rework that is required, the right first time approach. Most importantly, and as we will see with auto braking shortly, safety on the work site can be a huge benefit. Technology and the ability to build autonomous machines is already here, which you'll see in this video. The concept of RoboMag, the machine working here now, brings together sensor technology and, G and GPS. It also brings autonomous compaction control of the drum, a technology of today. This was the debut of RoboMag, a concept machine, at Bama 2019, and here it is working in autonomous mode with geofence boundary set. This machine can also uh, work remote control and also semi-autonomous, where you predefine the work site, but it can also work completely autonomously uh, with just a geofence set for safety and then just told to compact until it gets to the value that it needs to get to, at which point it will work by itself. So it's autonomous or it can be autonomous rather than command and control. But to put all this in context, we also need to understand you know, what's the reality of today on job sites, on many job sites? Where are we really at now to know where we should be going in the future? So a typical job site, lots of machines, lots of different manufacturers. Not many of those machines are connected apart from basic telematics uh, and there's minimal semi-automation. On some machines it's becoming more accepted on sites, more used, but it's still not the majority. And from the side that I deal with mostly is the compaction. This is based on method spec, which is tables that are written in the 50s, 60s, 70s, uh, with few operator aids uh, and few results recorded. But new standards are being set and goals to get along the way to automation are set now. Um, the safety element of documented technology is clear to see by the removal of operatives from certain areas of sites. People plant interface safety issues are reduced if the number of people on site are reduced. The line marking robot um, taking operators out of danger areas highlights some of the advantage of using this technology. A big step forward was the Highways England raised the bar statement that 3D machine control will be used on all major sites. 
this is a major factor in the increase of technology adoption over the last few years and sets the pace for the adoption of new technologies going forward. Many technologies and ideas need to come together to make automation a reality, as we've heard about today. Data, all sorts of things. But safety is always a key gain, uh, and this can be seen here. The operator was unaware of the tar coming his way. The barrier was his intended target. The roller was still accelerating as the sensor picked up the tar and halted the roller in a controlled manner. Various sensors, such as radar, as used here, LIDAR and AI-assisted cameras can be used to achieve this, or indeed, and probably more of a reality today, a combination of the sensors. This system, or this system here, is also um, speed dependent, so it knows the speed the machine is travelling at, and it actually increases the detection area and the stopping distance uh, by uh, working out the speed and the time it takes to stop. Autonomy is only one part of the process to achieve the bold goal. Connected machines, big data, telematics, IoT are all key. The gains in efficiencies from digital displays for operators and the automatic recording of data are well proven around the world on all types of machinery. And compaction machinery, not having them is like asking you to walk up and down an imaginary line on rough ground precisely, forwards and backwards, while counting all day long. Having the data live via the cloud is key to being able to make on the fly adjustments to the way work is carried out and can mean the reduction on the number of tests on site. The standards that are now being mandated, as we have seen, give efficiencies by taking control or guiding some of the elements of the process. The previous slide showed a connected site and here is a selection of data maps gathered from working sites. As a minimum, a, value, a visualization of the work progress for operators, as well as the automatic counting and mapping of passes is being used. The operator is then left to concentrate on rolling the correct area, the correct pattern, and also keeping an eye on his surroundings. And in tests around the world, a 20 to 30% saving unnecessary passes has been achievable. By using connected digital recording of site data, it has been shown that the amount of tests that, that a technician has to physically make on site can be reduced again, removing people away from danger. But it's not just on big earthworks projects where this technology is a clear winner. On, on uh, the road networks, we have intelligent compaction on asphalt, as shown in these slides. The operator, the site supervisor and the back office can all see the site as it evolves in real time. And once again, coupling this data with automated testing technology means on-site testing can be reduced, removing technicians from harm's way. Autonomous technology doesn't mean that we have to wait for the future. Elements are already in use today on asphalt with autonomous drum compaction control. Here the operator selects the layer thickness and then sensors pick up the material stiffness and adjust the compaction energy to suit. As the drums rolling, the sensors pick up and feed back the data to the central computer which then adjusts the compaction force. So as it goes forward, it's on maximum compaction. As he now rolls backwards, it picks up that there's an increase in stiffness towards the target, so it's still putting the compaction through. As it rolls forward a third time, it picks up the stiffness is increased and now it changes the direction of the compaction force, but also reduces the amplitude to so putting less force into it. This is all done almost instantaneously and autonomously. The driver just has to select the layer thickness and then leave the machine to do the rest. And it's the same with earthworks, the same similar technology can be used. The operator set to target level that has been identified by prior testing and then the sensors and drum take over autonomously, adjusting the compaction force depending on the sensor feedback. So as the target has been set, as it comes to a soft spot, the drum increases the force. As it gets the more regular compacted, it drops the force. 
and now when it comes to a well compacted area it drops it right down to almost zero this is operator free to make sure he's rolling the right lines and also to keep an eye on the site as he's driving Before I end, I'd like to share this film of a study completed with the cooperation of many companies into connected autonomous plant using the machines of today as a stepping stone to the vision of the future. So these are all existing machines off the production line, but fitted with all different types of sensors and technology. So first of all, this is remote control. So this is the unloading, unloading, get into areas where it's tight, or indeed, as Richard said earlier, to get out of areas. Here it's using a semi-autonomous where the operator on board drives forward and it then knows where it's been and repeats the same operation in reverse without the operator using the machine controls at all. And for safety, as you walk up, the machine takes control you see the operator's hands are off the controls and it stops itself so for connected and autonomous work here the paver lays a mat and the rollers know where the paver's been because the paver's told it and they then follow they automatically create their own work pattern and with the sensors on board know the temperature of the material and how many times it should be rolled So now back to the start, and back to where we want to end up. So perhaps it's a bit of back to the future. We need to utilize the technology that's available today. It's always good to look forward and our engineers love looking at the next big thing coming, but we also need to be aware of what's there today and that the job needs to be done today. So by adopting these technologies that are already advanced, it helps us plan for tomorrow where we can start to use more remote controlled semi-autonomous machines um, machines that look more like today's machines but perhaps with the operator only having to get to site and be a safety feature rather than actually operate the machine and then realize the future with dedicated autonomous sites ai planning uh, and self-delivery with just a few humans to monitor the progress so thank you very much i should be able to share my picture again there we go. Brilliant. Thank you, Giles. Thank you, Giles. Um, are there any um, questions for Giles? Or indeed, any 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 questions more broadly? I can't see anything in the chat at the moment. I hope you haven't fallen asleep. They're all still there. There's 61 of them still there. So. <laughs> No, I'm taking taking silence as being a good thing. Oh, yeah, it's Ryan again. I'll ask another question. Just in terms of <clears throat> RoboMag, do you, have you actually physically deployed it anywhere yet? And if not, why not? Uh, not outside. It, it has been used outside of the factory, but only as a study with the Kaiserslautern University. Uh, we've used it internally in our test round and showed it to what to the world. Um, at the end of 2019, actually working in conjunction with other machines and compacting material. Um, there's lots of different reasons. Um, a good one or the main one really is site safety uh, and also the, um, the framework to use it within. So we as a manufacturer and same as many manufacturers that I talk to regularly, I'm sure Vival will say the same, we can build lots and lots of interesting things and we can do lots of amazing things, but we need uh, a legal framework and also, to be brutally honest, a reason why we should be doing it because it's huge amounts of money and it's all very well having a nice shiny roller like the one sitting behind me. But uh, if it's so expensive that it's not going to be used by anybody, why make it? So it's very much a, it's a rolling, excuse the pun, it's a rolling test bed of all the different uh, technologies that are actually available today and it's also looking at the safety systems which are key one one element we had early on was that um, it's got multiple layers of protection 
So LIDAR for distance and this all, all, uh, stereo cameras for detecting the human form. But then they came up with the, the, the question is, OK, the roll is going forward, something happens and there's an object and a person both at the same place and it can't stop in time because these things can move at 8, 10, 12, 14 kilometers an hour. What does it hit? It has to hit something. So then you have to tell it so it has to avoid hitting the human form. So it's, it's testing all these technologies out and seeing what actually does work and what can work. And should, you know, should it be a control and command? Is that actually the best way of doing it? Or should they be given their work instructions at the beginning of the day and the left to go and run uh, and then come back at the end of the day when they're finished? So it's, it's really a study into it. But there are things like the last video. Uh, these are production machines. They're, they're, they're standard machines with bolt on sensor technology, much like Blackwell. Uh, did with on the A14 um, and that is technology that could be rolled out and indeed we are looking at things same as Volvo are and other manufacturers sort of in the in the fairly close future. Thanks Charles. What, what well how can I best ask this question what do you think needs to be done to the structure of the construction industry in, in order to make automation work effectively do, do you think the construction industry is ready for this level of technology um from my personal view and it's a conversation we had as part of the cap group on several occasions I think it needs to be and this is why we've got the clear the clear um, stepping stones it needs to be done in a in a in an informed way not that this is all going to be automated. We don't need anybody on site anymore because apart from anything else, that, that isn't a reality. If it takes in steps with semi automated machines, remote control machines, perhaps um, towards the end goal and can be proven to give benefits, health and safety being key among them, then that side from the workforce's side, I think perhaps wouldn't be too hard to sell as long as it's it's made clear from the start. The issue is, which I think Richard and Neil both said about, is that the way that the actual sites operate will have to change to make it work. And the sites need to be identified and strictly controlled, probably actually more controlled than the current sites are. And that's going to be the key change in the mindset of the industry. And it won't be suitable for all jobs either, obviously. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I, I see a question in the chat from James Seymour. Now I'm going to do a, a shameless bit of promotion of one of my old students. So James is working on a project uh, to develop essentially a top level operational framework for off highway vehicles, essentially the decision making for, for off highway vehicles. So if anybody is looking for a, an off highway engineer, James will be available in July, apply within. Uh, I believe that's 10%, uh, James. <laughs> so James's questions are, uh, is, um, how are emergency handovers currently programmed in the event of an off highway automated vehicle traveling outside of the ODD? Does it come to a stop, alert the driver and hand back control, continue traveling for a certain amount of time, um, or is that not defined? Um, I can perhaps answer this from the point of view of the mining and, and earth moving equipment. Uh, James, great question. The, the, the answer really is, is it can't. <laughs> so by definition, the, the maps that you feed the command and control, the, the central autonomous system, that is the boundary condition. So the, the, the computer will never ever task one of its vehicles to go outside the map. So for instance, if you if you give it a map area and say that is your um, haul route and you say actually trucks one through five can use that one, but trucks seven through eight can't, then truck seven and eight will never be tasked to drive down that haul route. So fundamentally the maps themselves are the method of control. Um, so it's it's not a case of th th this is what we were talking about before is that the, the vehicles themselves are quite dumb. They're not they're not deciding for themselves where to go. They're following the passing commands given to them by the, the central computer and the, the central command and control system by definition can't give an illegal order. Um, you know, it comes back to what Yanto was saying before the, these systems are <laughs> They're stupid in the sense that they're like Old Testament gods, lots of rules, no mercy. <laughs> you know, they will do precisely what you tell them when you tell them to do them, and that's it. <laughs> Brilliant, thank you. Um, I I think can, I, can I can I just add to what Richard sure, yeah. said there? 
there because we we did have this debate when we were mooting uh, the trial of VATT on on A14 because um, it's an obvious question, isn't it? Well, what what if that that dump truck um, decides to go somewhere where it's not programmed to half a mile down the road from uh, the trial ground? We we have one of the busiest trunk roads in in the UK. Um, it, it could have been catastrophic, but really the conclusion we came to was that the risk with automation, particularly for the reasons that Richard has described, is actually less than it currently is with conventional operation, because there's very little in truth um, to stop a plant operator driving a, a 70 ton gross vehicle weight dump truck, um, either deliberately or accidentally, and, and it's the deliberate case which is far more difficult to legislate against, um, um, deciding to take that dump truck somewhere that they shouldn't. Um, and that risk is totally avoided in, in the automated sense. So, and, and, and this, it reminds me, we, we understood the earthworks for, for Heathrow Terminal 5 back at the, the, the start of the millennium. And, and we, we faced that challenge from Heathrow because we were building a new terminal with 10 million cubic metres of excavation. Non-air non side, it was a land side environment, but within the, um, within the space between the two operational runways, separated by nothing other than chain link fences. And actually the conclusion was, short of putting in um, earth buns and so on to limit the, the chances of equipment running onto them, you're, you're, that risk is always inherent. And the risk is actually reduced massively by having automated equipment because for the reasons that Richard has described, it can't. It, it will stop rather than overrun. Brilliant. Thanks, Neil. Um, Kit, I will come back to your question uh, after Uva, if you don't mind. So Can I just say on that, I had a question. Yeah. I had a sort of question and a point, but I will also just add in my world that it's not uncommon for a tractor driver to have 100 hours under his belt in a given week during harvest. I would far rather stand in front of my robot tractor than a 18 year old student who's got 100 hours under his belt. That's a full stop. There you go. Yeah, I, I, you couldn't say it any, any clearer on that kit, albeit I must say for the point of clarity, our people don't drive for 100 hours a week and um, generally they're over 80. But, but yeah, couldn't agree with you more. Your hand's gone back up, kit. Was that another point or was that a... Well, because I do want to make the other point I was going to make. Go on then. Well, later, but uh, OK. I, <laughs> I, I was just... The concept of the ODD is interesting to me because... Um, our vehicles, and I mentioned this when we had a call the other day, our vehicles have to consider terrain and weather and things like that, not only for their own mobility, but for the job they're doing. You can't harvest wheat when it's raining because it will block the combine and you don't want wet wheat. You can't apply spray when it's windy. Um, and that's not hurricane winds, that's over 10 mile an hour. It's a, it's a fairly, you know, bit of a breeze really. So I quite like the concept of the ODD, um, but I think in our world that has to come down to a uh, it's not going to be vehicle. It's not going to be a tractor that has an ODD. It's the implement that has the ODD. And we are already doing this in agriculture in our study where for every implement that we put on the back of our tractor, there is a different calibration of the control system because dynamically the sprayer on the back of our tractor is very different than the seed drill, which is also very different than a trailer. So we already have different calibrations for different implements. Um, and this sort of ODD mentality that you're bringing in is interesting to me because I think it builds on that and adds to that. Um, in terms of what happens when it goes outside, well, at the moment, I say ours just follows a route plan. There isn't a designated safe area. It's just stick to your route plan. And if you go off the route plan by more than 20 centimetres, the system stops. And it's as simple as that. There's no geofence around the field, but there's a geofence 20 centimetres either side of the of the line that it's supposed to be driving. Um, so, yeah. Brilliant. Thanks, Kit. We, we may well come back to this um, at, at the end. So we are going to move on to Uwe Muller from Volvo to talk about their um, automated dump truck. And we can see your slides, Uwe. We can't hear you, though, because you're on mute. Now you should hear me as well. That's it, we hear you as well. Perfect, great. 
Thanks for the introduction, and uh, I think it's it's going to be fun for me to just hook on to what has been shown so far because uh, I see a lot of similarities, and I think we agree on many points. So that will be great for me to hook on to what has been presented so far, so to say. So what I want to talk about a little bit is uh, automation from a Volvo Group perspective, uh, because I'm part of a new business unit in the Volvo Group that's called Volvo Autonomous Solutions, and we are, so to say, the entity that's taking all the different vehicles, parts, machines that we have across the group and, and trying to automate them in, in commercially viable solutions, so to say. With that, I wanted to start here with a picture that we took 2018, which at that time just showed uh, a little line lineup of prototype machines, and that's a little bit uh, towards hooking up what the Jill's also said from the Bomac perspective. There's a light, lot of nice, fancy looking machines around there. But also there, we see this was all prototypes that time. Uh, that's also why most of them have that uh, strange yellow greenish color, because that was for us a reason also to show uh, clearly that this is still prototypes, so also a little bit manage expectations. But that already showed that already that time we had, you know, a fully for off-road uh, created autonomous vehicle on the left, fully electric. We had a, a FMX truck that we were running underground. We had a dump truck. We had a hub-to-hub -hub truck for running on highway and we have even an autonomous bus there so it's really a quite wide range that we were working on and that was also the reason why we started that new company you now to try to accelerate even more from a crew perspective and really bring all those learnings together uh, have a joint effort and not having too much in parallel and, and just showing prototypes but really bringing this together and bringing it to the market at the end and with that we also have uh, a clear focus now that we focus on level four automation and that means that the level one, two and three, which is more a driver support functionality that stays with our classical business areas. So if you're talking automated braking, light, lane keep assistant uh, function and things like that, that stays with the trucks. If you have like maybe some auto dig functionality on an excavator or maybe also some support functionalities like we've seen for Bowmark on the compaction side that stays with the classical Volvo construction equipment business. So we really focus right now on level four automation and they're really for me Level four is still where you have some kind of at least human interaction with the system. It's maybe not human control, but it's at least some kind of human interaction. Versus then long term, we will also uh, aim towards level five automation. And that's really, so to say, the end state where machines and systems will take own decisions and, and really react based on what's happening in, in the boundaries and also on changing ODDs, so to say. But that's uh, a little bit for the future. Right now, it's level four that we are focusing on. And also there to, to split that a bit down, more or less as we are covering the complete group, we have within Volvo Autonomous Solutions uh, three clearly defined segments and, and business areas that we are focusing on, where the first one is all the way to the left, but that we call confined. And here we are really looking at mining, quarries, industrial material handling applications. So that's really things where you have a kind of a fenced off area with, with repetitive flows. And on the picture here, you see a, a truck and trailer combination. That's a pilot project we are running in Norway in a limestone pit where we are running a 60 ton track trailer application and transporting limestone out from a quarry through a three and a half kilometer tunnel into a harbor to get uh, the material away from Norway, so to say. And then the little bit bigger machine on the picture there, that's uh, what we call the TA-15. That's a fully battery electric autonomous hauler. Well, we have uh, run two pilots so far. Uh, first research project 2018 in, in Sweden, and currently we're running another pilot in Sweden with another customer. And we, um, so to say, aim to now commercialize those solutions moving forward. Uh, in the middle, you see also prototype vehicle that we had created on, on the on-road trucking business side. And the segment here is really what we call on-road low speed. So it's like ports, logistics centers, and that's already quite often a mixture of confined and public transport. And then all the way to the right is what we call on-road high speed. And that's really then hub-to-hub -hub applications, public traffic on highway transports, uh, which is the most complex and probably with that also a little bit furthest out in time. But uh, worth mentioning here is also that we try to leverage and reuse all the learnings from the different segments to support each other, so to say. But here today, uh, as we're talking off-road, I really want to focus a little bit on the, on this product you see here on the slide, and that's what we call TARA, which is the complete electric autonomous transport solution. So as mentioned, it's autonomous, it's electrified, it's connected, uh, and that's also something that's maybe bringing a little bit a, a new view to things here, uh, because on this specific product, we really see automation as a kind of, as an enabler to make electrification commercially viable in the off-road business. 
And that's really here where we see the different uh, technologies, so to say, to supporting each other to come up with a complete new setup and solution that's still commercially viable. And also on top of that, uh, we want it to be more safe. We want to be it fossil free, at least locally, because it's electric. It still depends a little bit where you get the electricity from. That's also something I always want to mention. Uh, and me sitting in Germany, it's probably not the best example. We still have a lot of coal energy, but uh, if you're going to Sweden, Norway or, or other countries, I think you have a much better energy mix. So if you have green electricity, this is a real fossil free and CO2 neutral solution, so to say. And with the combination of all that, we also believe that the transport process as such is going to be much more productive. And here I want to start a little bit with what I mentioned earlier, the first uh, pilot we did here, which we called Electric Site, uh, where we electrified a, a, a complete quarry in Gothenburg in Sweden together with a customer. And that was a project we ran from 2016 to 2018, where at the end of 2018 we were running a four-month pilot. And I don't want to go through all the details here, but I, what, what I wanted to focus on today was it's called Electric Site, and then you might ask what has that to do with autonomous? The point here was that uh, we were replacing a fleet of three to four bigger rigid dump trucks, 40 tonners with electrification. So we started with thinking, OK, how can we do that? If we want to better electrify those 40 ton rigids, so to say, we, we will carry roughly five to six tons of batteries with us continuously. And also then we need to charge them sometimes during the day, um, charging them continuously with a low amount of machines or quantity of machines wasn't feasible. So that means you would carry even bigger batteries with you. With that, you also create power peaks on the grid when you start charging, which is putting a lot of cost on the customer. So you increase infrastructure cost. We still have the same amount of machines, so you still have the operators. You have the more and more expensive electric base vehicle, and then you're continuously carrying around a lot of kind of weight for the batteries, which is simply inefficiency. So that was for us really the, the point where we said, but what if we make the machines smaller, if we make the battery smaller, and then if we go from uh, sometimes charging to an opportunity charging, high power charging within the cycle. Uh, and with that, so to say, we will need much more vehicles, smaller vehicles. And then the only way to make that commercially fly, because you don't want to add operators, is to automate it. So here really for us, automation was coming from a business perspective to make electrification commercially viable really so that's a complete different setup on why to do it so to say and that's why i wanted to show the picture here but also what what we learned in this demonstration here together with the customer and also with different electric solutions on the side and also combination of manually operated uh, excavators wheel loaders to load those machines but also the autonomous fleet running in parallel, uh, we already saw in that proof of concept phase, so to say, that it's it's much better and more efficient coordination and control of all the assets in your site. Uh, you have a continuous production follow-up due to the fact that all everything is connected. You have much more highly optimized operations, which is uh, for sure an advantage, but this also drives the need for much more planning and preparation on the site. So you can't uh, run a site that ad hoc as it quite often happens today. So you really need to have a proper plan, production plan in place, how you set up the site, where you have your haul routes, uh, how you move the load spots and things like that. If you plan that properly, you can execute it, but it requires planning and that is also a change in way of working and that's crucial. But on top of that, we also gained a much better understanding of the production due to the fact that everything was connected. We had the live data. We did it in close collaboration with the customer who really has the day-to-day -day knowledge on what's feasible on the side and what not. And on top of that, here was for sure also crucial on that side that it was towards electrification. It was a public funded research project and that really made it happen, so to say, because otherwise nor a Volvo Group or maybe also a customer like Skanska would have invested just by themselves to, to show that something like this is possible, so to say. And with that, uh, going towards a commercial version of the machine, so not only changing color here, uh, it's much, much more to industrialize a product like that and really bring it to the market. And what this really means, uh, and that's also we need to have a repeatable and scalable business model. Uh, and here we also see that when we go towards autonomous solutions, that will also change our way of offering this to the customer. We will no longer sell those machines, but we will sell a service, transport as a service, we even call it. Because with this setup here, you see that the 
base machine, the hauler as such, is just one little element of the complete transport solution. The solution comes together with what we call the virtual driver, which is the automation system that's usually connected to something in the cloud. It could be some intelligence, it could be just some data sharing. You also will need to have the infrastructure on site. And in this case here, it's not only the communication infrastructure for automation. As it is an electric uh, solution, you also need the charging infrastructure and all that at the site. This needs to be matched uh, so to, sorry, towards customers' operations. So it's really a tailor-made solution that matches the specific use case. This will come with a complete new need for service and maintenance. It's not just servicing, so to say, mechanical equipment. It's also an IT infrastructure. And all that together, so to say, led us to the change in business model and without also different payment and financing solutions from a customer perspective. And because that's a business driver at the end which will decide, will this fly? or not. You can develop technically the most best solution in the world. If it's not commercially viable, it's not going to happen, so to say. And with that, I also wanted to go a little bit into what does it mean from a, from a setup perspective, so to say. So we said communication is crucial. We heard that today and we also uh, realized, and I think we heard that several times today, communication is critical. And we also realized that Today, with where we are, uh, across Europe specifically, we have to have different setups. Uh, in many cases, we still maybe need to have a Wi-Fi solution because there is no infrastructure right now on cellular and just building up an infrastructure for a small quarry. That's again, not commercially viable, but sometimes there is a 4G infrastructure and that might be sufficient, so we can use that. And in the future as well, we have to be future-proof, so we can also run our system already today on, on 5G. Like, for example, for this, we built the first 5G industrial network some years ago together with uh, Ericsson on our test track where we were running those machines. So we have all those solutions to be able to apply it based on what's commercially viable and also what's available. The next thing then is talking about infrastructure. So we, we need the charging solution, but also the charging solution here is fully automated. It's part of the cycle. So there's... In, Principle two ways to charge those machines. We have an integrated onboard charger, like you know it from your electric cars, where you just plug in the, the electric vehicle to a charge interface box, more or less. Uh, and that is an 11 kilowatt charger, which is more in, intended to be used for charge overnight, workshop charging, and, and things like that. But then there is, and that's what you see on the picture here, there's a fully automated with a pantograph solution, high power off board charger with 150 kilowatt. That means with that power, we are able to put 2.5 kilowatt hours of energy into the machine within a minute. And in an average uh, quarry cycle, you're usually somewhere between three and maybe seven kilowatt hours per cycle. So that means you have something of roughly one to two and a half minutes of charging per cycle. But then with that, you have to simply consider that as part of the cycle. And with that, you have to dimension your fleet size accordingly. So it's not that this is kind of like a loss in your process. You simply need to take it as part of the process because that's what's needed and able to kind of electrify your solution. And then last but not least, I think that's also something we have talked a lot of today, we heard a lot of today, is safety. Uh, and here, uh, I think as you all know, uh, specifically safety is one of our core values at Volvo. It has always been and it will always be, so that's for sure something we will never compromise on. And that's also why trying to bring this solution out to the market. Uh, we need to certify it. It's a machine, so we have to certify it according to machinery directive in Europe. That's pretty obvious. And that brings specific needs. And that's also giving us uh, a setup that we have to limit the so-called ODD from the beginning. So we will start with an initial commercial version where we will not allow mixed traffic. That means those autonomous fleets have to be separated from the other machines. The only machine that we can incorporate into that setup is the loading equipment, but with that, so to say, you make that wheel loader or excavator or whatever it is part of the autonomous system in one way or another. And with that, you have, so to say, different levels of safety, as we also heard earlier here. So one level and the first level here for sure is the physical separation using barriers and fences maybe, and, and quite often in quarries you have a natural barrier with the different benches. Then we also imply an emergency stop system, which is a functional uh, safety certified solution, redundant to the standard solution. So that even runs on an own radio frequency, and that's redundant in that base also that all machines are connected to it. If a machine loses connection, it stops immediately. And that also gives the guy, whether in a control room that's surveilling the site or also in the loading equipment, at all times the opportunity to stop the complete autonomous fleet just pushing a button, so to say. 
On top of that, then comes the traffic control, and that's what we heard about earlier uh, with the GPS space, the geofence, so to say, around all the machines. So the control room knows where all the machines are. Based on that, it can distribute the machines. It can uh, secure that the machines don't run into each other, that the machines take the right, right path. We also have the same uh, setup than what Kit to told us with the tractors. So there's a pre-programmed GPS path. If the machine goes off more than a predefined uh, kind of distance, today we are also using something around 20 centimeters. The machine parks immediately. And then the last resort, so to say, also like we heard today, is then the obstacle detection system on the machine. And here we're also using a combination of lidars and radars to really have that as the last resort to, so to say, secure that the machine doesn't go uh, run into something. But, and that's also important to understand, if you would like to take those sensors from a functional safety perspective, according to machinery directive, there's less than a handful of sensors on the world market today that you could use for this and their range is very limited. So with that said, most of the times, the sensors you're using here, they are more to secure productivity than to secure safety, and especially personal safety. So that's also something we need to keep in mind. Uh, and with that, it's it's a small machine and we are really going to downsizing. So uh, we really want to replace several big machines. And that's again, a similarity to what Kit showed us on the, on, the, on the farming side, so to say. So we have a seven ton base machine weight, but we can load 15 tons. And that's also already an efficiency improvement compared to standard trucks. We can more or less load double the weight of what the machine has itself. It's pretty small. It's five and a half meters long, two meters seventy is wide, two meters fifty high. We're currently running it at around seven meters per second, which uh, is twenty five kilometers per hour. It's a six hundred sixty volt DC system, and that's a common system that we share across the group. So we have similar components like on our buses and trucks. So that means we have power optimized batteries like we are using in our hybrid buses. We have an electric motor per axle that we are using also in our trucks and buses today. And also here, talking about batteries, we are also using a part of the total battery capacity to secure battery life with the amount of cycles we are running on the machine. And then to show you that this is not just a, a theory, uh, I have a little video here on where we are running this setup now on our test track in Sweden. And it's a similar setup we are currently running with the pilot in Sweden as well, where you have the combination of manually loading, autonomous transport, fully electric, you have much less noise, you have low local emissions, or better said, zero local emissions. So it's a much more sustainable, efficient solution. Also here you see the charging process is fully automated, and with that becomes part of the cycle. So with that, uh, I wanted to give it a little bit of a different tweak that also automation can be an enabler for other technologies to become commercially viable. And with that, uh, I thank you and I look forward to some questions. Brilliant. Thanks, Eva. Um, there is a question in the chat from Alex Osborne. Uh, hi, Alex. Nice to see you. Um, he says, with ever increasing population, uh, how are OEMs justifying the inevitable reduction of jobs in the off-highway industry? That's a very good question. I get that also quite often, I must say, uh, but I, I can push that question straight forward back. And in some cases, it might happen for sure, but I must say in Definitely the majority of cases, I would even say 90% of the requests I'm getting from customers, we get the request for automation because they can't find operators. So this is more to help the industry survive because they can't find people. Which, with, and if I interject at that point, that's, that's exactly the point that, that I made in my introductions uh, to the A14 trial. Because obviously we, we have that challenge there. We, we, we employ three or 400 plants operators and, and Inevitably, the question was, well, uh, what's going to happen to us when you automate? And, and my response was exactly as we would describe. This isn't about replacement. This is about um, supplementing the existing workforce to satisfy the, I mentioned the huge growth demand, particularly the UK earth moving sector. Those, those huge UK um, earth moving growth demands that we're going to see over the next 20 years. Fundamentally, it's going to be very, very difficult to find enough people to drive the equipment. So automation will come in to supplement rather than to replace that workforce. And with that, I think it's going to be an incremental change, so to say. Absolutely. And with that, we will also see different needs and different demands for other kind of competences in the workforce. And that's also something that the industry needs to develop. And I think that's going to be on par. So we have to make that happen both in parallel, so to say. 
a good question. Uh, there, there's a second question there. Um, has cyber security been, been considered? Yeah, there, there is a section in the Code of Practice about cyber security, and, it, and it's certainly one of the things that uh, there is a fairly high level of consciousness about in the in the industry that, that cyber security suddenly becomes a really important thing. Um, there's a couple of comments, pe people agreeing. Uh, I saw a hand go up and then the hand disappeared again. I don't know who that was. There's two hands up, I think, or one at least. Why can I not? Why can't I see them? Oh, now they're down, it seems. Well, well sometimes they disappear after yeah. after a few after a minute it? or so. I think. Ian, Ian, so let let me just make a point. Um, I I I had a eureka moment during um, Uber's presentation there because I've been aware of uh, the Volvo. Um, initiatives now for the last four or five years and have always questioned the, um, the logic behind having a, a smaller capacity truck because in earth moving, um, as, as Kip was explaining in agriculture, the drive has always been uh, um, bigger and bigger. Bigger is best. What limits the size of, of our equipment is, is the size of the work sites plus, plus the ground conditions, um, which is really the same in, in, in agriculture, the overcompaction of the soils. But I hadn't understood, and it was a really, really clear explanation from you were that um, in order to make electrification work, you have to have smaller dump trucks because electrification fundamentally isn't isn't suitable for larger equipment. But in order to make um, that commercially viable, you can't have human beings driving them because the reason you have larger equipment is to reduce your labor cost, you know, the economies of scale out of labor. If that's Certainly. no longer an imperative because they're automated, I can see now that um, a smaller payload um, equipment is, is absolutely viable. And then that goes back to, to the benefits in agriculture that, that Kit was espousing as well. So that, yeah. yeah, that to me, having looked at this for a long, long time, that's, that's been a real eureka moment this afternoon. So thanks for that, Eureka. <laughs> Cool. And, and it's really, it, it's the, what, that is one thing. And as I also mentioned, the other thing is really the electrical infrastructure together with the charging. Because yes. if you have several or many small machines and you have charging part of the cycle, you more or less have always one machine in charging while the others are running. So you really leverage out your power supply that you have from the grid to an average over the complete day versus on sm some bigger machines, you create power peaks and you all know uh, your grid infrastructure is kind of built up for peaks. That's what you have to pay for. That's what you have to invest. And that's driving a lot of cost. So if you can pull down your grid connection, that also saves a lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 a quick parish notice. We're, we're on a break until 20 past three. We will carry on dealing with questions over that break. So the next question is from Dale Campsall from Construction Equipment Association. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, very interesting set of presentations. Uh, this was lightly touched upon earlier. I just really uh, appreciate the views of, uh, of some of the speakers. Um, most European law, uh, certainly where mobile machinery is uh, concerned, is written around having an operator present. Um, the operator shall have visibility the operator shall uh, whatever it uh, whatever the specific aspect we're looking at clearly these machines are in are in use um i'm assuming your guys must have looked at this and figured out how do we make sure we legally comply and yet you know uh, and yet have these machines that are operational so i'm just wondering how you handle this from a legal uh, perspective i'm sure the machines are completely safe but clearly being safe is one thing, being compliant with the law is uh, is another, and they're not necessarily the same. So I would just like to understand what your view and how your 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 approach on this was. Thank you. That's a, it's a very good question. I can at least answer from, from a Volvo perspective. And you're fully right, specifically in the machinery directive and in many ISO standards, it's always referred to a driver, an operator, and, and how you need to react and how, how, what you have to do. And I think uh, what we are currently doing there uh, is we're currently reviewing those cases. Uh, and at the end, in most cases, it's kind of an industry standard recommendation on how you have to handle one when you have an operator. And the only way we can handle it from a uh, machinery perspective right now is to describe their use case then from an automation perspective. And that will for sure then also drive that. I think in many standards, we will see updates and changes towards autonomous machines and that's also why we have decided to in the first step really 
limit the ODD to, for example, have not mixed traffic, have non have not other manually operated machines around uh, and also have not people allowed there because with that all the safety regulated questions they simply disappear with that. That was one of the reasons why we have to limit the ODD. Then we can show something, have it out together with customers and then I think that will also help us driving the discussion with the regulation bodies to update those standards, so to say. Uh, there's another. There's a question in the chat from uh, Ryan, and in fact, Richard has started to deal with it. But why not cameras for obstacle detection? We're actually running trials with those now, <laughs> with, with cameras. But I don't think at the minute the current technology, no one technology is the answer, and that's that's the that is the answer. I think at the moment, certainly, um, and it also depends on the application. Uh, obviously, AG slightly different because you've got obstacles. That you're actually you are trying to run over. Um, so we've found, or so far, we've found a combination of lidar, radar, depending, and also the cameras. Uh, that's given a really good combination with the with, with the long longer range for the lidar and radar uh, for the camera. Sorry, and the lidar and radar up, up much closer as the final failsafe. That's the same for us. So we're using a, really a combination and we also have a camera on the machine, but that's more also for the case that if you have a guy in the control room, then your LiDAR or radar gives an issue, uh, reports uh, there is something, then you can connect to the camera, check what is it. So it's really the combination of all those sensors. There is not the one sensor that's solving all. I think that's the right answer. Fully agree. So from, from my angle, in principle, I love the idea of cameras because they're cheap. Um, and there is some really interesting stuff going on but of the 10 companies i've approached to try and do this sort of stuff probably three of them were camera based um we've sent literally video footage from the front of our tractor driving up tracks and through fields and things to various companies who will say oh yeah, yeah send us some footage we'll be able to pull all the obstacles out and send it back to you within a week and and then and then the line goes dead once you send the file over so um you know there's a lot of promise um i think it's not quite there yet um basically but it will, I think it will come, the visual odometry stuff. And, and just further to that, the, the, the thing that Kit's fundamentally driving out there is that camera camera based detection all relies on a neural network as an image classifier fundamentally, as opposed to a hard ping signal return. Um, and so the, the issue is, is that uh, certainly in the mining equipment, the, the, the safety standards that are that under pin ISO 17757 require deterministic behaviour, um, the same as an avionics package in an aeroplane. And anything that's based on a neural network, by definition, is not deterministic because it's, it's a computational black box. You can't predict how it's going to behave. Um, part of people like you know, Uwe and Kit and, and Yanto, the real, you know, all, all these smart Peter, the smart guys in the room, as opposed to us upshifters. Um, that that's going to be a a a coming coming package of work to actually see whether people can essentially Tesla is, is the pinup boy for this is internationally. They they have the largest number of run runtime hours of uh, large scale image classifier running running in the wild. Um, I suspect at some point somebody is going to validate one of these beasts, and uh, and at that point, once it can be validated, um, the issue is always the edge case. It, always the edge case. So, um, you know, an image classifier. If if you go onto Google and and look up um, adversarial neural network attacks, and have a look at some of the things where you can you can trick the image classifier into, you know, thinking that the small child is actually a hot dog. You know, it, it's 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 quite interesting. Um, yeah. I, I uh, see Matt Bryant. Is it is it a quick question, Matt, or if it's a it's, quick, one, we'll deal with it now. It's just a quick follow on Yanto from. Um, so we were we we're talking about cam cameras and stuff, and also it was mentioned a few times earlier the idea of say a an autonomous combine, for example. It needs it needs to run stuff over. What uh, is, is there anything being developed at the moment, sort of in the circle of what if there's something in, say, for example, if there is a deer in a field of wheat, how can you spot that deer? Would that be possible? So, um, yes, I think there, there's promise, but again, nothing tangible yet. Uh, some of the radar technologies look like we can, you know, use certain bands of radar to look through certain things, but bounce off other things. So it, it's a, 
a dense object you get a ping but if it's some wheat you don't um but no one's done it yet i don't think um it's just promise and i have to say um um to to mention bosch who jumped in earlier i think we have a radar on the way from bosch so thank you bosch <laughs> so i think i think we've got one on the way but but yeah there's there's promise for things that can see through but nothing i don't think i've seen any demonstrations of that yet brilliant thank you chaps so we're going to move on now um to discuss the another part of the code of practice that deals really with the kind of implementation phase and and the the kind of hard decisions and the hard policies that are going to need putting in place um, as you start to implement your uh, your automated system. So I'm going to hand over to Mark Courtier, who is another uh, member of TRL staff and was part of the authoring team for the Code of Practice. Thank you, Yanto. Uh, hopefully that has come up now. Yeah, that's all good. Thank you. Yeah, great. Right. So, yeah, I'm going to talk about Section 3, which talks through planning and implementation. So uh, before I get too into it, just a reminder of where that sits in the document. So Peter's already talked about the concepts that's um, to support safe implementation of off highway automated vehicles. And then section three follows on from that. It is the large bulk of the document um, and it talks about the planning factors for planning and information, planning and implementation. Um, so that goes into the specifics and detail. So in this section, the kind of main things that we talk about are what new operations and procedures are going to be required for automated operations and how existing operations and procedures might need to change when you're switching from automated to automated uh, operations from manned op operations. So the focus of this is we're assuming people using the code are familiar with health and safety management systems and reporting requirements. Uh, they're familiar with risk assessments and safety cases. They're familiar with off-highway vehicle operations. So we're talking specifically about the stuff that's come up due to automation. Um, and in particular, how potentially this is quite different. So one of the key themes that runs through this entire section is a lot of automated operations are quite deterministic. Um, that varies a bit system to system, but um, you're expecting it to do some of the things and very precise things. So that requires quite a different approach to planning and implementation. You don't potentially have humans in the system who can show initiative. Um, so that kind of changes the need for planning and implementation and potentially makes it kind of stricter. Um, so what do we cover in section three? So um, it's quite, it is a very large section. So there's a lot that goes through here. So um, we've got a section on consultation and review. So that's talking to both internal staff, but also external parties. So you might need to consult with uh, contractors, emergency services, um, local authorities, landowners, those kind of people, and as well as the manufacturers and developers of these systems. They may want to be involved uh, with your implementation. Um, we talk at quite length about design and planning of the worksite. So this is one of the sections in particular that focuses both on what you're additionally going to require for automated vehicles and also things that already exist, but may now be more important due to um, implementing automated vehicles. So, for example, we talk in here, one of the sections is talking about minimising interactions between autonomous vehicles and workers, which may well already be something that occurs, but it, this now becomes potentially a very critical part of the safety case for these vehicles. So that has to be thought about very carefully. Um, this has come up already, but we talk about, um, so autonomous vehicles might be dependent on good network connections. So that's now something that really has to be considered in the design of your work site. Uh, we have a section on operations activities. So this discusses, again, both new activities and activities that will need to change. So, for example, with checks and inspections um, might become more important because you don't have humans involved in the system. So your triggers for maintenance might be different. Um, this That section also has a bit on data and cybersecurity. So that's obviously a very large area, but we give some starting points for people to start thinking about those factors and then references for where they can go and find further information if they need it. Uh, we have a section on initial implementation, so discussing both validation on single and multiple work sites and other factors to consider when transitioning between manned and automated operations. Uh, we've got a section on incident management, so that talks both about the um, reporting requirements and things like that, but also the analysis uh, and then things like how does 
the automated vehicle know it's been involved in an incident? What does the vehicle do after an incident? Um, and some factors around recovery. So um, if a manned recovery crew has to come in, they want to know what state the vehicle is currently in. Is it safe to approach? How do they isolate it? Questions like that. Uh, we've got a section on ongoing performance monitoring. So given the complexity of some of these systems, um, validating them is very challenging. So you keep on having to monitor the performance of the vehicle to check that something hasn't changed or a particular edge case has been reached. So that becomes a very critical part of keeping the whole thing safe and checking it staying within the boundaries of what it's been designed to do. And finally, there's a section on change management. So this is talking about software or physical changes, uh, and those can affect how the vehicle behaves. That needs to be managed very carefully. So that's what's in it. Um, to give some more information about where this might actually practically apply, I'm going to talk through a few issues that are come up in, they're not just from one of the headings in the uh, code of practice through multiple bits. So first I will talk about barriers and access control. So in this, I'm both talking about physical things like fences, um, railings, ditches, also electronic things. So geofences would be considered here and kind of key card access systems for people. So there's quite a lot of factors to consider just with this one object on a work site. So your position of your barriers might now matter a lot more. So if the autonomous vehicle's navigation is dependent on the, the barrier being in a certain position, then that barrier has to be in that position. So it might be following the path of the barrier or it might um, stumble across a barrier. And if that's out of place, it might stop and not know what to do. Um, so the position of your barrier might become a lot more important and it might have to be a lot more precise. So with manned operations, if a barrier is two meters to the right, that's almost certainly not an issue. Um, but it may be an issue with an automated vehicle. Um, the importance with relation to safety of the barrier might increase. So um, human drivers, for example, know that people don't always obey instructions. Um, but if the barrier is part of the safety protections for the automated system, then people absolutely have to not cross that barrier. Um, and either they'll have to be additional safety protections on the vehicle, or you have to ensure that that compliance with the barrier is what you expect it to be. Um, so that has implications on maybe the design of the barrier and the specification of the barrier. It might have implications that you now have to actively maintain the barrier, um, or you might require a system to monitor compliance with the barrier. So if you have another system involved to monitor compliance, then the uptime and failure modes of that system now have implications on the safety of the overall system. So coming back to some of the concepts mentioned in section two, you have not just the vehicle for these things, you have everything related to the vehicle. And also, you if you don't have as many people around, you don't have people to report issues. So if your barrier is blown over, then you're not necessarily going to know about that. Whereas with manned operators, hopefully someone would raise that and maybe go and deal with it. So even with something that's relatively simple feature of worksite, there's quite a lot of factors to consider. And the aim of the code of practice is to um, ask questions of people operating these things so that they think about these things and um, plan around them. So the next thing I'm going to talk about is um, validation and multiple worksites. So in most cases, it's quite likely that automated vehicles are going to be built for off-highway applications are going to be built in relatively small numbers. Um, and they may well be purpose built for a particular application. So they're not going to be built in the thousands and have type approval processes and things like that. Um, so for single site installations, you'd expect a validation process to occur on delivery of the vehicle. So when it's delivered from the people building it, then you'd expect some checks that it operates and can do the functions that it's expected to do well. And also there'd almost certainly be some testing of the safety systems to check that they perform as expected. But for uh, automated vehicles, and particularly as complexity and the independence of the vehicles increases, covering all of the scenarios that a vehicle might come across is very challenging. So there also has to be an ongoing monitoring um, process to check that the vehicle stays within what it, the ODD for the vehicle, within what it's designed to do. Um, so that's an ongoing process, not just something you do once at the beginning when it's been delivered. 
you have to keep paying attention to these things. And this challenge increases further when a vehicle is being used on multiple work sites. So, for example, you could see a scenario in construction where it's part of the vehicle's job is to regularly move to a new site. Um, and even with a mature system that's mature and you're confident in, you're going to have to check that the new work site stays within the operational design domain for the vehicle. Um, so that might consist of desk work or it might consist of site surveys. So you might need to go out and check the ground conditions are actually what you expect they are and are within the capabilities of the vehicle. You might want to go out and check that there's no anomalies in the radio frequency environment on this new site. Um, so this is to check that the vehicle will still be performing, uh, operating with its ODDD. It won't be required to do something outside of that. And if in this kind of um, process um, you come across an untested feature or capability of the vehicle that hasn't been used on previous work sites, then that's going to have to be validated. So there's complexity here, um, both in the single installation sites, but definitely for multiple, multiple work site scenarios where um, there's going to be quite a lot of preparatory work that needs to be done before automated vehicles can be rolled out. So next, I'm going to talk about maintenance requirements. So currently, manned operators are likely to spot and report issues. Um, but if you've got wholly automated operations, um, so if it is the kind of factory scenario where everything inside the fence is automated, then there's potentially not um, a human there to spot issues, either with the vehicle itself or with the environment. So in a quarry, there isn't someone potentially to spot an unstable looking click face and report that. So this now has to be considered in planning. It's um, and the rigor of that kind of has to increase potentially. So that could be done either through inspection regimes, which may already exist, but there's kind of no fallback now on that. Um, or through technology, so condition monitoring systems or systems that look at the environment and report stuff back. So this now has to be planned for. Um, and in the example where everything's inside a fence, um, major failures may not necessarily be hazardous to humans. Um, that's the purpose of putting every, all the automated operations in their own place. But the question remains, what happens after that? So unless you have an automated recovery system, then it's likely that humans are going to have to go in to perform this recovery. Um, and that operation might be hazardous. So if a vehicle has got stuck on uneven ground or fallen off something or is damaged, and that's potentially dangerous. So it's not just the operational reasons you want to ensure these things are done well. You, it's also to avoid having to put uh, manned vehicles or people into situations that um, are complicated and potentially hazardous. And finally, I'm going to talk about um, change control. So um, this is another factor that um, might have to be thought about in a more rigorous way. So um, in most cases, maybe not all, but in a lot of cases, what the automated vehicle does is going to be deterministic or fairly deterministic. So for the same set of inputs, it should do the same thing. Um, and so therefore, its behavior only changes when the software or hardware is changed. So this has several implications. First of all, the vehicle doesn't learn something. So if it always stops somewhere due to it detecting an object, it's always going to do that. It isn't going to learn to pass that. Um, but also it has implications for when the software is updated. So um, you might want to introduce a new feature or behavior. Um, and that's only going to be possible through doing a software uh, or hardware update. Um, and that may cause the desired behaviors to change into something you want. But it also might have um, other implications that um, occur. That, um, that have a safety, safety uh, impact. So that has to be a very carefully controlled process. So um, it might be appropriate to have different levels of control for different levels of update, but that has to be thought through very thoroughly. So for example, a simple update on a GPS system that's just considered basically maintenance. Um, if that goes wrong and the position of your geofences related to the vehicle all suddenly move a bit, then that has a safety impact for something that maybe isn't seen as a major impact. So, sorry, a major update. So um, these processes now have to be thought through. 
um, if your vehicle is dependent on the behavior of a server um, in an office many miles away, then and that's updated and that's going to change something on site, then the people on site need to be aware that that's changed. Um, so the demands for change control are quite strict with automated vehicles. So um, those are some hopefully practical examples which give a flavor a bit more of what um, Section 3 is about. There's um, a lot of subject matter covered in that. Um, so yes, um, hopefully it's of value. Um, anyway, thank you. Um, that's me. Brilliant. Thanks, Mark. Um, are there any questions specifically about um, the, the implementation phase of introducing automation? Or silence again. I'm going to share my screen. Find the right screen to share this time. That'd be useful, wouldn't it? One second. So we've come really to the end of the programme of speakers for this afternoon. Um, I wanted to um, acknowledge the work that's been done on this project. So we've had um, quite a big project team, uh, certainly on the on the TRL side. Um, if my slide ever loads up, I, I, I have a cast list, but I shall uh, I shall go quickly through my cast list. So Doris Nicolides, Ailey McGregor, How Ye, Indy Gill, Izzy Obazele, Kirsten Huseman, Malcolm Palmer, Mark Courtier, Penny Weil, Peter Ball, Rebecca Wilford, and Richard Oliver were all directly involved in the in the creation of this document. Uh, and we also, of course, have a much bigger support team at TRL who have supported us in the development of the document. Um, I should also acknowledge the support, the, 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 the financial support that's been given to us um, by Innovate UK. Uh, and the practical support that was given uh, throughout the project by Oxbotica, who were our partners on the on the on the project. Um, I should also like to acknowledge the contribution of all of the people who contributed to the uh, to the stakeholder engagement exercise. Uh, we engaged with quite a broad set of people across the industry in in a variety of different roles, and it was really useful to to get that input. Uh, and finally, I'd like to thank all of you who have made the time to to, to spend with us this afternoon and to, to discuss uh, off-highway vehicles and, and, and the automation of off-highway vehicles. With that done, then, um, I'd like to ask very broadly if there are any questions about anything that we've spoken about today and any uh, any comments or observations um, about the, the, the code of practice or more broadly about um, the steps that we might need to take as uh, automation becomes more widespread in the off-highway sector. Oh, complete silence, that's, that's, a, that's a good sign. Is it a good sign? Maybe it's not a good sign. <coughs> Oh, now everybody's starting to once. One at a time. It's uh, Paul Spence here. If I was, uh, ask a general question, and um, do people think that there will be a convergence between um, on highway and off highway uh, autonomy systems, and will that be sort of coupled with when off highway systems can work um, in environments where there are more people um, operating as well? And it's very very clear that you have controlled areas, um, I imagine that there's quite a lot of opportunities for uh, sort of semi-controlled areas where there are other people operating and you know, working as well. And maybe um, the on the highway uh, problems or when, once they're solved can, can help the semi-controlled environments. I'm, I'm happy to, to take that from the earth moving perspective, if you like, Ian. So, sure, Neil. Um, and, and let me use an example of a, of a typical large scale earth moving work site. B 
being HS2, so um, it's split into multiple contracts, each about 35, 40 kilometers long for, for the earthwork specialists. There will be, I don't think there will ever be um, a case where um, on a Friday, all of the conventionally controlled equipment's parked up and on a Monday, everything is, is automated. It'll be a step change because there will be certain activities so over that, that 35 kilometers along the subcontract area, There'll be certain activities which lend themselves to to automation because it's generally going to be if i go back to that principle of, of automation in the earth moving sense will suit those continuous and repetitive activities and it stands to reason that the, the longer the continuity the greater the repetition the more suitable it will be to automation so frankly the bigger elements of the earth moving mass all the, uh, the transportation of the greatest volumes from one area to another particularly where they can be segregated from number one other trades um other non-earth moving trades on underway on the site but also from um uh, from the general public so where there's no interface with, with the local road network by way of plant crossings or anything like that i think it's those discrete elements of work which will see the first automation and then it will gradually be on mass it expand into uh, into all aspects as because a lot of this to me is was, was clearly a, um, a commercial hurdle to overcome um, as a practical hurdle to overcome but a lot of it's down to confidence and I think what we did on the A14 was all about building confidence showing people that we can operate a dump truck albeit in a very controlled environment an automated dump truck could be operated on a live construction site the next step in confidence will be to see it be a field scale trial undertaken and then into limited commercial application for full scale application. So I, I don't think it will be a dramatic change. I think it will be a gradual change. That's certainly as far as earth moving is concerned. I think it's interesting that, that as the technology develops and, and, and we obviously see um, a kind of ra ratcheting up of um, the on-highway people learning stuff from the off-highway people and then the on-highway people spending a lot of money and building a new thing and, and we, we do see a ratchet and I, and I think they will uh, I think that will continue for some time it, it, it'll be interesting to see uh, for example where Tesla ends up with with their camera based systems and, and whether that ultimately uh, gets to the point where it is commodified technology that that, that is that's at a price point that's you know, reasonable for incorporation onto um, plant and machinery. I, th I, I think, think the economy of scale that um, you have off car, so on 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 highway, the economies of scale will you know, will at some point help you put a more generic uh, solution um, for the off highway um, where you, you know, the, the difficult problem is always when you start having to interact with people um, and understand what you know, people are doing and therefore how to react that's going to be a big problem for the on highway um, off highway you have a bit more controlled situation in general um, and, and some very specific tasks so i think have the advantage there to in the way of, 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 of early starting yeah, I, th I think that's true to a certain extent and in some applications. So, so I, I think, um, as I mentioned right at the beginning, if, if you're in a situation where you can put a fence around it, then you, you've you got a relatively easy start in terms of what your automation needs to do. There are big challenges if, if you're on you know, a constricted site where you've got multiple operators who, who are not necessarily under, under your control. So things like construct, you know, um, building construction sites where, where you might be on a very tight site to begin with and you've got lots of subcontractors coming and going. That is a is a, a, a problem that is at least as complex, if not more complex than, than running a vehicle on the road, um, because at least on the road, there is a set of rules, where, whereas in, in a construction site there in, in terms of um, road etiquette, there may be no rules at all to begin with. Any more questions? I think then it'd be useful to outline 
what happens next, certainly from a TRL point of view. So as I mentioned right at the beginning, um, we created this document um, with Innovate Funding. We created it effectively unbidden. So we were asked to look, or rather we bid to look at uh, the safety of uh, off-highway automated vehicles. And using the funding that we were given, we created th th this document. We created it with a view to enabling the development of this industry. You've gone on mute for some reason, you had to. Some, somebody muted me. Thank you for that. It's, it's probably not a bad thing. Um, as a number of people said, th there is a problem in um, the, the, the structure of the industry, if you like, that without a, a, an, an effective legal framework, you find yourself in, in a fairly difficult situation in terms of effectively having to write your own rule book. Now, we've come to the end of this project, we've reached the end of the funding, but that doesn't mean that uh, the problem or indeed the code of practice goes away. So the intention for us, um, for the immediate term at least, is we will act as the host for this document. It'll, it'll be freely available from the, the TRL website, as will this, uh, the recording of this event this afternoon. Um, but really, we would like the support of the industry if um, this is viewed as being a useful thing, we'd like the industry to support it and adopt it. So TRL are very happy to be the custodians of this document, but it doesn't necessarily want to be the law according to TRL. This, th th this ought to be the law according to the industry and an agreement very broadly between um, all of the voices from agriculture and construction and logistics and ports and airports and wherever all of those voices together agreeing on a uh, on a common set of guidelines. So, as I say, TRL are very happy to act as the custodian of that document, but but it shouldn't ought to be um, purely the, the 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 work of TRL. And we'd be very interested to hear from people once you've had chance to to read the document and thoroughly digest it. We'd, we'd be really interested to hear your feedback. Are there any more questions or any more observations? And as soon as I say we'll draw to a close, a hand will go up. So this is your this is your chance. Will it be only thing I'd say, Ian? So is, it sounds to me as though you need to feed for budget regard. Yes, absolutely. So it's it's yeah. a finch. They they they, they it's like. A finch. Oh, yeah, sorry, sorry. I'm far more familiar with dump trucks, but I am um, birds. But there we are. Yeah. They, they they like joining in with conference calls. Brilliant. On that note, then I will uh, I'll draw to a close. Thank you all very much for attending. Thank you very much to the speakers. Uh, I think we've had a really interesting afternoon, and it's. Um, uh it, it, it it's been uh, a fascinating discussion a question has of course popped up which is when will the document be ready to be downloaded and the answer is that it is available now so that i believe at least uh it should have been sent to you um when you um when you registered for the event but if not there is a link at the top of this chat for for where you can download it from brilliant thank you very much all and uh, hopefully we'll see you all again very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers, everyone. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.